this is a transitional period. Transitions aren't easy. The bear steepening that we've seen in the curve over the past several weeks and months has really driven everything. Eventually, you will have to refinance at these much higher rates, and that's the reality of higher for longer starting to bite. Markets have started to price in these different expectations for bond markets. Okay. Investors are looking for any glimmer of hope to start a end of re year rally. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramwitz, and Tom Keen. John Farrell continuing on vacation. Saw him yesterday on the cruise. Yeah, what a great turnout on the cruise at yesterday. Thanks to Sikorsky for getting me back up. Catherine Greifeld. Catherine Greifeld joins us this morning. She said she'd only come in if BitDog hit 35,000. Yeah. She's here. All right. She'll explain why Bitcoin's popping Love way over 30,000 <laughs> here. It's going to be in your IRA soon. We'll get to that uh, in a minute. Greifeld, Abramowitz, and Keen here with a really interesting show here because yields are up. Thank you, Bill Ackman. Things are a little better. But Lisa, I walk in and I look at the Bloomberg terminal, 8.04% on the bank rate 30-year mortgage. Eight, we're, you know, we're now solidly getting above 8%. And that's what I think with this yield story, that's what people are living. Well, and this, I think it's a great point that basically we have seen these incredible fluctuations. We're talking 20 basis points in a couple days in the long end of the yield curve. And people are saying this volatility can't continue or can it? And they're so focused on the volatility that they're forgetting the levels. Mm. And the levels yes. that we're at we're are suddenly different. And that causes a different <clears throat> reality for people actually financing the nuts and bolts of their businesses and their lives. Economics with Bramo, the levels what matters in the level last night on earnings i'm going to go forget about the gloom the media wants to go oh google they're all going to die <laughs> Microsoft was like a charm. Yeah. It was it was like if you run central casting, Satya Nadella, this is exactly what we want to say. Microsoft was exactly what on target. I think uh, the fact that you had two behemoths comprising 10% of the entire S&P index coming out and you had Microsoft really, B, blow it out of the water, Google disappointing, both on the same metrics, which is cloud computing, right? Microsoft winning, Google losing. Yeah. At this point, what it shows is is the dispersion that we hadn't been seeing before. Everything had been going in line. Suddenly, you can have one winner, one loser, and it can kind of balance itself out in the overall index, and you have a consolidation right. of market share in specific sectors. Yeah, well, it's a 4% move. We got a 330 on Microsoft, the gloom and doom popping up to 342 uh, this morning. We got to get it out of the way, and we'll repeat it every hour. Her agent said we have to. Greifeld, Bitcoin with a pop. What happened? I thought it was all over at 16 or 18,000. There is a lot of optimism right now that maybe we're finally going to get a U.S. spot Bitcoin ETF. That seems to be the primary driver between, behind what we've seen over the past two weeks or so. But uh, I'll note, from a traditional ETF industry standpoint, we're still potentially far away. We're, okay, this is critical. I, I got to stop the show here because this is about global Wall Street. Global Wall Street wants to sell Bitcoin. Why can't they? They, well, so the thing is, you can offer it in private funds. A few of the big banks have been doing that. But to get it in an ETF, which you can go onto your brokerage account and buy it with one click, that hasn't been available yet. But the question for Bitcoin is, who who's going to yeah. buy it? Bramo, I mean, Bramo wants to wait. Okay, well, no, Are you I, thinking? I have a couple of things. Okay, number right. one, do you like being pegged as the Bitcoin correspondent? It's nice to have a lane. Okay, you know? all right. Number two, I'm just wondering whether it's become obsolete as one of the global features as we're talking about havens as we talk about the potential for it to be a, a commodity-like substance. Well, the beautiful thing about Bitcoin and why it's not so bad being the Bitcoin correspondent is because the narrative changes all the time. You can attach yeah. any narrative you want to the crypto no. world. Welcome to surveillance. That's what we're doing. That's what we're doing in surveillance as well. I'm going to keep the data check short. The brief is so important. Red and green on the screen. The yields, yeah, they've come in a little. Thank you, Mr. Ackman, again. But I really want to emphasize yields have not adjusted technically. 5.08, two-year, 4.87. Now, 30-year bond, just under 5%. Brent crude if I can find it uh, on uh, the screen. I have so many properties, I can barely know where to look. $88 a barrel on Brent Cood. Shall we brief? Let's brief. Bank of Canada rate decision. A lot of people would say, who cares? I care a lot. It's at 10 a.m., and it often sets the tone for the rest of the central bankers. Uh, the next one being tomorrow, the ECB. Two-year yields kind of flattening out here. The expectation is that they will hold the new pause, the new condition.
additional pause that we're going to get all across the complex. 1 p.m. Okay. This is just for you. There's going to be an auction. <laughs> the auctions are getting more exciting. There is yes. the U.S. Treasury selling $52 billion of five-year notes. Okay, you're falling asleep. This is anything <laughs> but sleep-worthy. Yesterday, there was a two-year yield auction, two-year bond auction. Normally, no one cares about that because that's basically been pegged on the front end. And yet, everyone was paying attention on tenter hooks because are we going to get the same kind of reaction as we've gotten on the 10-year and the 30-year auctions, which were messy? I know you're sitting there thinking to yourself, just keep selling it, Bramo. But I am going to keep selling it because it does matter. And today, just continuing with the earnings picture, Meta and IBM shares coming out, uh, their earnings coming out after the bell. Yeah. Year to date. <clears throat> Just giving you a sense of the dispersion between the haves and the have-nots within the tech space. Meta, up 160% year-to-date. Well, IBM, IBM, down 2.2%. And frankly, IBM off the Google Cloud disappointment maybe has some real value to peruse here uh, this afternoon. Look to Bloomberg Technology for cover on that. And of course, we will look to the eastern Mediterranean. Our Oliver Crook is in Tel Aviv, and we'll have a brief here. Other worthies uh, coming along as well, including Anne-Marie Horton. We start strong with Marvin Lowe, senior global macro strategist at State Street here. In this time of con confusion and cacophony, <laughs> I guess I have to rebalance, I have to reallocate. Has the rebalance formula changed because of this yield move? I mean, for sure, everyone's thinking about, you know, whether 60-40 is appropriate. Um, what we're seeing uh, in terms of the institutional investor is that they're so underweight fixed income at this point because the losses have been so great that they're still trying to catch up. If you're a bond bull, right. it's encouraging because they're still <clears throat> engaged with the asset class, but do they settle below that 40% once we get there? I thought of you. They said Marvin Lowe's going to open the show, and I thought of you. In a cold of winter, Peter Lynch used to walk around the streets of Boston <laughs> without a coat on. He looked like Jim Jordan, except it was 10 below zero, and he'd have his value lines in He's walking to meetings with Will uh, and, and the rest of Patina and the rest of them. Okay, great. That's all fine and well, but to me, the securities analysis now is just out the window. It's about survival. How do you survive in an allocated portfolio? I mean, for sure, um, you are reevaluating duration in, in terms of the story. And you have to remember that duration is much more than just your fixed income holdings. The U.S. equity market is very duration heavy, so you've got to be really conscious of where those long yields are affecting your portfolio. Um, keeping powder dry right now is not a crime. Um, absolutely not, particularly given the shape of the curve, particularly given that the Fed's going to be you know, higher for longer, probably for a lot longer than people think in my mind. Um, you know, keep that powder dry because things are still going to be rough going into next year. What does that mean, powder dry? Because it doesn't just mean that you take cash and no. you put it in a mattress. No. Do you put it into T-bills? Do you just keep it into your treasuries? I, I, I love bills. Um, two years feel pretty good to me um, at this point also. You know, if you wanted to extend from your bill uh, structure in your portfolio, I think, you know, you could add that kind of duration. Um, you can nibble on the 10-year for sure, you know, if you like that income. But, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the short end out to two years. Does this mean that you're concerned about risk uh, equity valuations and other parts of the market that maybe haven't fully comprehended the level and have ignored it because of the volatility that's gotten so much more significant than what we're seeing in equity volatility? You know, for sure. If we look at, you know, even since the, um, since the Middle East conflict, it's been rates that have moved. Everyone else has been kind of frozen, if you will. Uh, the dollar hasn't really moved. FX hasn't moved, and equities are trading, you know, fairly well in a wider range. Um, they're not reflecting the volatility that rates are showing. And, you know, ultimately, I, I say to a lot of folks, the most important number out there is that 10-year yield, and that 10-year yield is unanchored right now. And that's what I want to talk about, staying in the fixed income market for right now. I mean, the most important question, it feels like, is why are rates rising? And I'm looking through your notes, and you write that you would push back against the buyer strike thesis. Why is that? Um, first off, um, you know, like I said, the institutions institutional investor is still buying. They're still trying to get back to their benchmarks. Um, we actually are able to also look at cross-border flows at that uh, institutional level, and they're still buying. So um, they're buying it unhedged. There's uh, various 
stories around the dollar um, that you could um, infer from that. But MOF data around Japanese buyers, they're still engaged. China um, kind of looking at tick data, tick data. Uh, they're not buying as much, but they're buying based on what their reserves let them buy. So we really haven't seen that kind of buyer strike that seems to be one of the themes that are out there. Certainly, um, all of the issuance is an overhang. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, I agree with you, Lisa. It's like these auctions become more and more important, particularly as we go into November and understand how the next phase of um, all this deficit funding is going to look like. But the buyers are engaged. There's just a lot of paper right now, and the knife is pretty big and falling still. Well, to that point, OK, maybe there's not a buyer strike, but there is a lot of supply here. And with that in mind, you look forward to next week, which is going to be very fun because we have the refunding announcement in addition to the actual Fed decision for the direction of this market from here. Which do you think is more important? Um, you know what? I think the, the supply is more important. Um, the Fed's message is pretty well crafted at this point. Um, it shows that they don't really have a handle on how this is going to evolve, and I think that's part of the volatility, volatility out there. But given um, that they've pulled back and, and turned more, you know, less hawkish, if you will, with the volatility in the market, they're not looking to introduce much more into it. At this point, we have nothing priced in for November. That's correct. I think they're ultimately done. The question really winds up being how much longer we stay at these, what they believe is restricted levels. It sounds really gloomy. Sounds pretty rough. Sounds concerning. Azure of Microsoft posted a 29% sales gain yeah. in their cloud services business. At a certain point, you take a look at the gloom and the doom, and you take a look at some of the cash producers, and they're minting money. So yeah. at a certain point, why are they not the havens? Um, you know, I, I, I believe I believe they, they still are. Um, you know, we do like those big moats that are ultimately uh, quite defendable. Um, and if you're looking at the return that you get from cash, and you got these companies that can generate the cash and actually return it back however they decide, it's, right. it's, it's, it's an advantage from so a valuation perspective. So this is a key thing. I, I, I get what you're saying, but in this earnings season, we're proving it once again then do you less diversify and do you shift from index to more active management? I, you know, I, I think that active managers are going to have their day in the sun. It's, 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 an, it's been a while. I want to quote you on that. Robert Armstrong was brilliant <laughs> in the FT yesterday looking at the recent track record of active management. And you're saying this is the time for active managers to choose it's, correctly. It, 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 it matters. Um, and these duration discussions that we're talking right. about, rather than just nilly-willy going into it based on kind of what, what an overall <clears throat> market capitalization is allowing you to do, becomes important to right. my mind. That's going to be interesting. Marvin Lowe, thank you so much. Yeah. Greatly, greatly uh, appreciate it. I love the phrase keeping your powder dry assistance here editor-in-chief cbe emails in from london and he says keep your powder dry tom come on know your cromwell english civil war 1642 oliver cromwell keep your powder dry think it's your english history meaning. for this morning slightly I was different writing forced it down. to do the editor-in-chief said i have to do that <laughs> you know when british history comes into what we're talking about you have to talk Oliver, about Oliver Cromwell. Gunpowder. What was the other Civil War? All no. I can say is you're nailing the keeping your powder dry. How's the triple triple leverage all cash? The triple leverage all cash is doing fine here, but this is really important. And, and Lisa, this goes to the technical construction of the market now. We've had a pullback, a price up, yield down. But on a technical basis, there's like zero veracity to it. We need a lot of constructive work here to begin to demonstrate lower yields. On a technical basis, it's still a ping pong. I mean, basically what you're seeing right Every now. Day. Yeah. Every day yeah. is another ping pong, and you're not sure where it's going to bounce and if it's going to hit a weird corner on the ping pong table, and that's sort of <coughs> where we are, which goes to Marvin's point. We are sort of getting unanchored in terms of where that yield is, whether it is fundamental or whether, to your point, okay. Katie, it's something about the refinancing. People disagree. And yeah. the, with the ECB meeting coming up, I guess quickly to Marvin Lowe here, is the ECB unanchored? Um, no, and it's because their transmission mechanism is clearer than what we're dealing with here. We're seeing these higher yields make their way into their economy. Right now, and, and, and Chairman uh, Powell said it last week, based on, the, based on the evidence, we might not be restrictive. Even though they've been saying that they're restrictive for the, you well, know, their gains are restrictive for the last uh, that, three to six months. Mar Marvin, thank you so much. And this goes, Lisa, back to this stunning event of the last six days, which is 5% GDP. Well, the I mean, reacceleration, the fastest growth in two years yeah. in the U.S., which we're expecting yeah. to get tomorrow. Yeah, how does that complicate everything? The narratives of our A block in the six o'clock hour really shows the confusion that's out there. We're going to try to give you some clarity here. Importantly, coming up the seven o'clock hour, she's from Boston, is well 
with Marvin Loeb, Katie Kaminsky joins from Alpha Simpler. What is it about Boston today? They what, don't just what happened me. with the Red Sox? It seems it, like you're well, Thank you. Mention the Red <laughs>
people becoming so locked and so entrenched um, that they only hear half of what anybody says. I mean, we've, we've heard what's happened with the secretary general. People read the part of a statement they wish to read. They ignore the part that speaks to both sides. And it makes it very, very hard for our diplomats to get this crisis into a landing pattern. How much has the U.S. lost its leadership role as it has the uh, fourth candidate for speaker in three weeks and doesn't have the capability to vote on a lot of the resolutions that Biden's talked about? Well, I, well, we'll see what happens today, whether there is this, you know, whether Mike Johnson gets that vote and whether that aid package, that, that demand that, that Biden has put forward that would see aid for Ukraine, for Israel, for the southern border, for many other things um, supported. Um, and sure, the rest of the world looks at what's going on in the House and kind of can't believe that this is the United States of America. But I think they also recognize that America has a problem at home, but it has some very serious leadership across all parts of the country, not only in government, also in the private sector. America is the only country, according to the IMF, that has recovered uh, and, and exceeded its pre-pandemic levels of growth. Um, so I think that there's a recognition that there's a resilience in the U.S. that is not reflected in the House and that this is something that everybody will be watching as we get closer and closer, not only to the current debacle, but especially to the November 2024 elections. And Leslie, obviously this is a fluid situation, but one of the many headlines that caught my eye yesterday was S&P coming out and cutting Israel's rating outlook to negative. And part of the reason for doing so was that they currently assume that the conflict will remain centered in Gaza and also last no more than three to six months. And I'd love to hear from you whether that's a realistic time frame and also the idea that it'll remain centered in Gaza. How big is the risk of spillover here? Well, if you take a look at the piece by Dan Byman in Foreign Affairs, he makes it very clear. If this spills over into the West Bank, then we're in trouble, and there is certainly potential for that. And this is, again, where active diplomacy is really the name of the game. We can make <coughs> predictions three to six months. Um, I mean, I think the, the, the most significant question right. is, under what conditions will this run longer than three to six months? And the condition is, if Iran gets involved, if it explodes in the, in the West Bank, uh, and if that makes it much harder for other regional actors in the Gulf to play a positive role in working with the U.S. to bring some sort of peaceful resolution. And Leslie, I was on a cruise yesterday with John Farrow doing a speech, and on the way back, yes, that's what I read. The Byman uh, article in Foreign Affairs magazine, really extraordinary. Dr. Vinja Murray, thank you so much uh, with Chad Amas. I really can't say enough about this, Lisa. I have not read the Jake Sullivan yet. I'll put both of them out here. I believe these are login-free from Foreign Affairs because of the moment. But uh, Byman is, is absolutely definitive on the three levels of Palestinian history, Palestinian authority over to terror groups like Hamas and it's it just it frames out clearer than the emotion we're getting on the day-to-day -day news. What Leslie said there I think is so important also because everyone's focused on grievances and and the history which is deep and painful and it's sort of a competition of of, of pain really uh, and uh, there's plenty to go around. How do you then come forward? How do you come up with a solution when two well, people aren't ready to come together? I mean it's you know it's, it's a very it's a very um, fraught situation and all the leaders coming together, not clear that they're having better time trying to resolve it. And Catherine, I thought your question was great because it goes to this arch fear is that we always go into wars and conflict. This will be short. Mm. We'll, we'll get this done. This will be done by Christmas or this will be done by, you know, the start of baseball season. And there's no history of that. I mean, going off the blueprint you know. of Russia and Ukraine, obviously that war has lasted a lot longer than most people had predicted. Certainly Russia. Yeah. Uh, it'll be interesting and important to see whether this actually follows that time frame. We're going to continue forward here on economics, finance, investment on our fractured international uh, relations. Futures red and green in the screen. The VIX under 20, though, 19 points. To, to yes, we will speak of the miracle known as Microsoft. Coming up, Karsten Bresky of ING on the European recession. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Good 
uh, Bloomberg Surveillance. Good morning from New York. Catherine Greifeld in for Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramwitz, and Tom Keener. An eventful uh, day here into an ECB uh, meeting tomorrow. We'll get to that, what it means for Chairman Powell and for the U.S. as well. Just under 5% in the 30-year bond, 4.99. I've got a 10-year, 4.86%. We're up four basis points, so we come back from the nirvana of the last the celebration, I should say, of the last 48 uh, hours. Red and green on the equity screen. The VIX 21, 22 has come in nicely under 20, 19.17. Uh, looking at Brent crude as a measure of the tension in the Eastern Mediterranean from a 93 level over the last couple of days, 87.99. I guess we'll call that $88 a barrel as well. Because of the importance of our guests, let's dash to it. Under surveillance, Lisa Abramowitz. <laughs> Under surveillance today, House of Republicans. Guess what? They still don't have a speaker. Now the latest is they've nominated Congressman Mike uh, Johnson of Louisiana, their latest choice for a speaker, the fourth in three weeks. And Johnson is a vocal ally of former President Trump, saying he's, quote, very confident he will be elected uh, speaker when Republicans hold a vote at noon Eastern. Tom, I got to be honest, at a certain point, when do you just start saying, <clears throat> we can't keep doing this? The fourth speaker in three weeks? And can he get even enough support if he is somebody who has worked so closely with Donald Trump and yeah. is uh, someone who's alienated a lot of people in Congress? You see the frustration in the media, a lot of sharp words being said, we're not going to go there. It's not what we do here. But our guests will allow to go there, Greg Villier, uh, to give prospectus here on to be cordial, something original, and many people would say damaging to our relationship with our allies. Well, to that point, I mean, Katie, this is something you've raised, this issue of the credibility of the U.S. and the mm -hmm. ability to keep borrowing at low rates. I mean, how much does this have a market move? How much is that underpinning some of the volatility? You have to wonder, and I mean, this is an important time. There's real work to get done, of course, when it comes to aid to Israel, Ukraine, etc., but also the fact that we're hurtling towards potentially another shutdown in mid-November. Uh, this is a pretty yeah. serious time. And the distinction this morning is Valier, and he, we'll talk to him later, I believe. He's, as, Greg's on the schedule, right, guys? Amy, help me here. <laughs> you know, the interns didn't brief this me this morning. This is how we morning. have meetings. You know, no, the interns were, you know, they're, they're like, they're coming in late, you know, midweek. You know, At least they're coming in. They, thank you. <laughs> yeah. What are you, HR? <laughs> Go on. But the, the, the point is, is it's drifted over to the Senate. We've moved from a House discussion to it affects the Senate. Why don't we continue so the before more I lose my side job? Of things. On the corporate <clears throat> side, uh, Microsoft posting its strongest sales increase in six quarters. This was thanks to continuing growth in its cloud computing unit. On the flip side, Alphabet's cloud division falling short of analysts' estimates. The concern here is that the division is growing between Google and its rivals. At a certain point, how much, Katie, are we starting to see in the haves and the have-nots of the cloud division? Or not necessarily a macro story underpinning some of these names. Can I just say it's so nice that we're talking about the cloud business and not AI, which is, of course, Thank going you. to be Thank part you. of the Thank discussion. You can come back tomorrow. <laughs> okay, great. Well, I already set my alarm. Along so, with the interns. But the fact that you have this uh, pretty binary outcome between uh, what we saw with Microsoft, what we saw, saw with Alphabet, it's going to be really interesting to see what Amazon brings to the table on Thursday. Of course, they are the big leader and then some. And the distinction here, to be quick, is, is Amazon is co-opting Microsoft knowledge for their processes. They're using, you know, this was announced like 10 days ago. Mm. They're using Microsoft within Amazon for their processes. I also wonder about how much, uh, you know, Google talked about a lack of spending on uh, some of the development within corporations. Is that a Google question or is that a macroeconomic question? It's not I what I heard from Microsoft. Right, so. exactly, that's exactly my point. I wanna just talk about this story. I thought this was fascinating, sort of a sleeper, but really uh, crucial for the global economy. Chinese property, de property of a developer, Country Garden defaulting on a dollar bond for the first time ever. The firm failing to pay $15.4 million in that dollar bond interest and now likely headed for what would be one one of the nation's biggest ever yeah. restructurings. Tom, you've been talking about this, the property crisis in China, and suddenly we're starting to see signs that there might be some kind of response by the government. What's it like if there's a big enough crisis where the President of the United States wanders down Constitution Avenue and darkens the door of the Eccles Building? That happened in the last 48 hours in China. I assume you covered it yesterday when I was coming back from the cruise, but 
President Xi showing up at PBOC mm. is a bombshell. For the first time ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah a physical visit. I mean, the sim symbolic importance of yeah. that, it's hard to overstate. But, I mean, you think about this steady stream of stimulus we've seen from Beijing. It's still not working its way into the property <clears throat> sector. That is still a big pain point for China. Well, the, also the idea that he's willing to let the deficit get deeper and to borrow more and that this wasn't enough to really generate some sort of well, rally in markets because people say it's not enough mm. really highlights the yeah. fear of the scope of the problem and how many people have we heard who say Chinese assets and, are uninvestable at a time where there is this degree yeah. of uncertainty and opacity. And just an insight here, I, I, you know, I noticed Gucci went down because Katie didn't darken the door in <laughs> Fifth Avenue Gucci enough uh, this sequence, but Hermes just in killed economy? it. And they did it in China. I mean, but Hermes, distinctive from the others, said, you know what, China's not so bad. Hmm. So that's a, that's away from the property uh, debate as well. We're going to continue on these many narratives that we've got right now. It's just really, you know, mines. We'll get to the Arizona Diamondbacks here in a moment. Karsten Bresky's looking at me like, Arizona who? Global head of macro research at ING. And what's so important here with his academics out of Germany is public service to the Netherlands of working with their ministry. I want to go all Martin Feldstein on you right now, who used to define the core of Europe. Is Lagarde and the ECB face original structure, original challenges, and politics? Is there still a core of Europe that you've lived? We still have this core, but the problem is that the core currently would need lower interest rates because the core is Germany. The core is Germany being the segment of Europe, being stuck in stagnation, facing so many structural transitions that actually, you know, if it was for the core, probably we would see lower interest rates. I, I, I did this once for David Folkert's Landau. We were sitting in London, and he said, make me a chart of what Italian lira would be like if there wasn't a euro. And the answer is it wouldn't be, you know, 120, 116, the original number would be like one. 50, whatever. What euro is most efficacious for Lagarde? I, I haven't done these, the whatever back of the envelope estimations recently, but I think currently we're, we're fine because we do have this extremely weak euro, so this should help a little bit the export sector. Um, the problem is, given that the world has changed so much, given that China is no longer just a nice export destination for Europe, mm -hmm. but rather has become a rival, I think the euro matters less for export and therefore for European growth than in the past. Great. Just another thing to basically add to the laundry list of problems that Christine Lagarde has to deal with and will have to announce and address tomorrow. This is really the conundrum. We saw this with yesterday's data, the PMI data out of Europe. It looks like they're in a recession and they're likely to experience a recession in the second half of this year. They also are seeing sticky inflation that has multiple drivers. How does the ECB respond? Do they just stay where they are in paralysis, hoping for something to change? Well, the ECB has been, I think, too optimistic when it comes to the growth outlook. So now when we get GDP data for the th third quarter next week, we will probably indeed see that there is already a contraction. So again, a very mild recession coming in in the, in the Eurozone. But this ECB, I think, has, as so many other central banks, they have been so wrong on inflation. They simply cannot afford to be wrong again. So they will have this tightening bias built in, um, which means no rate hike tomorrow. But there could still be a rate hike before the end of the year. And then we are in this high for a longer story. If you do get oil prices rising, and natural gas for that matter, especially given the increasing ties to Qatar of a lot of European nations at a time where there's increasing unrest in that whole Middle Eastern region, how does the ECB respond? Can they hike rates? They can't really control the price I would, of oil. I, would, I wouldn't do it if I was Christine Lagarde, but this ECB is different. The ECB of Mario Draghi wouldn't do it, but this ECB knows that well, when you look at their own projections back in September, the ECB projected inflation to come down to 2% only in the third quarter of 2025. With these oil prices, this would be shifted towards probably early 2026. And if you only had one job, and this one job is to bring down inflation to 2%, and then not 1.9, not 2.2, but 2 0.0%. I think they will be inclined to at least leave the door open for further rate hikes. And Carson, when you think about that delicate economic backdrop that Lisa walked through, what is the line between stagnation and stagflation? 
Well, you know, we are in a stagflation environment already. So this is a kind of stagnation, whether we see a, a short contraction or maybe meager growth, but this is stagnation. And this stagnation in the Eurozone will continue. Mm. And I disagree with the ECB, which has always predicted that there will be a rebound sometime. But I think we're really in a longer episode of stagnation. And then we have we have inflation. So it's not it's, it will be coming down in the coming month, but then goes up again on the bank of positive and base effects from oil prices. So this is not the 70s, but it is a 2020s stagflation. And when you think about this bond sell-off that we keep talking about, I will admit I usually talk about just the U.S., but it's been global in nature. It's been in Europe as well. And the narrative stateside has really been that this is doing the Fed's work for them. The Fed speakers have trotted out that narrative as well. Does that logic apply to the ECB? Definitely it does. Well, the, the the rise in bond yields was not as strong as it was in the U.S. here, but clearly I think you know when you when you look at the models and you know, how much you give on models these days. But I think it's you know a, a change in bond yields has four times the same impact on the economy in Europe as a change in the policy rate. So this would clearly now do the work for the ECB, and that's the tricky thing for any central banker. So having increased rates in the case of the um, the ECB 450 basis points more than one year, and now yeah. it takes another. Year year before we really see the fall, the full impact of the rate hikes. There's probably 10 points in a year where I, you know, the show just stops. And one of them was the former prime minister of Italy, Mr. Gentilini, at the IMF meetings in April, where he just stopped when I asked him about eurosclerosis. There's a conceit right now that Europe has escaped 6 and 8 percent unemployment, that Europe has gone to some new form of better nominal GDP. Do you buy it? No. Because um, we, we are still back in some kind of new eurosclerosis story. Yes, the labor market is different, but that is thanks to demographic change. This is why unemployment rates are so low, and we haven't seen the same reaction by low growth on the on the labor market. But when right. you know, we we are we are. <clears throat> A lack of investments. We still have high deficits. The world has changed, which is you know uh, harmful for an export-oriented economy. So we are still in the. But middle. this is critical. Like, I'm going to pick a year, a 2026 euro sclerosis. Is that feasible? Is that something we should be studying, or are the elites of Europe move beyond that study? Remember, Tom, that prior to the pandemic, we were already talking about the Japanification of Europe. Um, so whether it's a Japanification, whether it's a Eurosclerosis, so we are now, as Europe is always in the middle of all these geopolitical tensions, um, Europe does not have enough own right. resources, commodities, energy. So we are in, and we have done too little structural reforms. We're still hesitant in order to use huge fiscal stimulus to get these investments done. Yes, right. 2026 sclerosis might be possible. Carsten, thank you so much. Just really, really uh, 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 important there. Carsten Breski of ING there, again, was his work with the uh, government of the Netherlands. Lisa, to me, this is an arch question. There is a conceit out there that because of service sector dynamics, what Ned Phelps of Columbia would call dynamism, that Europe has somehow moved beyond what we lived for years, which was a higher unemployment rate. And I got people like Breski and Gentilini going, eh, Maybe not. Yeah, this is the difficult moment because what is going to generate the same kind of growth in the Euro region akin to what we see in the U.S. with the tech sector, with artificial intelligence, with productivity? And this is really the big issue if all of a sudden you're looking at the biggest stocks <coughs> being tied to weight loss drugs and luxury products. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, drive forward the weight loss drug story. In the last couple of days, it hasn't been good news. It's like fake ones out. People are getting injured. Well, that's the thing. I mean, it feels like the, what we're seeing with the weight loss drugs has almost been the AI moment for healthcare. But oh, I like that. We're talking it's about so healthcare. So we're talking Pharaoh. about drugs. I mean, this is going to take years to recognize the risks attached, in addition yeah. to the opportunities. And yeah, we're trying it on vet bill at home. Does that work? <laughs> <Four good? laughs> we're trying it on the damn that dog. dog. That Catherine like Greifeld with insight there we would never get from John Farrell. Red and green on the screen right now. The VIX 19.17. John emails in. Good morning, John Farrell. The Dow, 33,312 on futures. Stop trolling him. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs>
clearly the consumer in these earnings is holding up better than expected, somewhat cons confirming that better retail sales that we got in September. The consumer balance sheet still is healthy, even though at the margins it's deteriorating. Eventually you will have to refinance at these much higher rates, and that's the reality of higher for longer starting to bite. And we'll be doing a poll later. Do you want Tom Keen or Cameron Dawson on air with you in the morning? <laughs> Let's do that poll. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> how are those? Uh, you know, I've got to go back to vet bill. Did you really put a vet bill on Ozempic? Yeah, I'm we did. Call, we did. It's a know, testing. Vet control I, and to I, make I, sure I, that vet bill yeah, gets Mrs. Fed. Keen has a medical history, and she says, we're not even trying it on you. We're going to the dogs <laughs> first to do it. And, I mean, uh, pet Ozempic is on the way, yeah, right? That has so? to be the next yeah. stage. Oh, come on. It's true. You know, <laughs> pet Lexapro is really hot. It's, we're not kidding, folks. Katie's <laughs> dead on uh, there as well. We'll have much more on that on the pharmaceutical front. Red and green on the screen here. Dow up, actually, fractionally. I don't know what to make of it. i got to get my percentage thing. Let me move the gerbil here over. We're down three-tenths of a percent on the S&P 500, 19.17 on the VIX. The yield space, uh, help me here. We had Bill Ackman came out, bless the world, the bond market stopped, okay. and it was price up yield down. Is it over? Okay. First of all, anyone who says that Bill Ackman's tweet saying that he closed out of a short position was the reason why we've seen volatility in the 10-year is fooling themselves. Okay, number one. And honestly, I, come on. Am I wrong? It's ridiculous. All I have is the lines, but uh, I will say, if he actually opened the short when he tweeted it, and if he actually closed it when he tweeted it, I mean, worked out pretty well. He did really well, but I will just say there was a lot behind it, and there's a feeling that maybe he was picking up on some tech Technical closing out of shorts that were pretty global in nature That's the thing. at a certain point, right? It's not just him. He might be feeling the tea leaves in the market. And kind of, you he's know, probably watching surveillance is what he's doing. Well, come on, you know. and you can explain. Do you think that you are responsible <laughs> for this move? Right. We're going to dive into this right now, and it, it was really shock and awe here. Just on a personal note, I've got computer people in my family, and you get the call, you got a beverage in your hand, and these people are way smarter than me, trust me. Way, they, 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 got, they got the A's. And they're like, hey, stupid, chat GPT is the real thing. And we learned that yesterday at 4 p.m. Moody says it's going to start writing their work. Did you I, see that? I, I, I'm the ignoramus here. Mandeep Singh is a smart guy, senior technical analyst in what? Bloomberg Intelligence. What did you learn from Mr. Nadella yesterday? This was the mother of all home run reports. Yeah, I mean, the Azure acceleration, I, I think they sort of sandbag expectations because last quarter it was like 1% no. one, 1 contribution from AI-related stuff. This quarter it was 3%. And the expectation okay. is it's going to keep growing. But everyone knows that they are looking to deploy their large <clears throat> language models, train their LLMs. Right. And uh, look, this is a secular trend. This I mean, Tyler Radke at Citigroup published, I believe it was this morning, maybe late last night, and he just basically said, you know, this is like a complete report. Define what Copilot is. Yeah, so right now they have a GitHub Copilot, which basically allows uh, developers to be more productive because it writes... For a fee. For a fee, and they are charging $10, and they have about 10 million, uh, you know, people signed up. So it's it's already a pretty sizable revenue That's stream. like your newsletter. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> right, well, $10? Wow. All you right. got 10 million okay. people on it. All right. So they can, you know, you can hire ChatGPT to fill a seat, which I think will be a beautiful thing uh, one day. But this raises this question, and I'm going to steal some of Katie Sunder because she had mm -hmm. a really good point earlier. This idea of have we overplayed AI and not empathize? emphasize the cloud enough was the real surprise for Microsoft really just purely the cloud and the AI discussion not really there and the same story except the reverse kind of sentiment for Google. I mean, look at how much these companies are investing in CapEx to build their infrastructure. So clearly, there is a huge upfront investment. And in terms of the monetization, Copilot is one form. Then renting your cloud infrastructure is the second big form. And they are launching a big uh, 365 Copilot starting November 1st. So that could add to the revenue in addition to what we heard about GitHub. And uh, look, at the end of the day, cloud training is where the money is because that's where the GPUs lie. I mean, everyone knows NVIDIA had a big lift because of the GPU demand. Well, guess what? Who are buying these GPUs? It's the hyperscalers, and then they are renting it out. The big fear right now is that Google's gap 
its lag behind the cloud competitors is only growing. Do you see this as evidence of that? I think Google, uh, again, is more uh, niche in the sense that they don't have a legacy in enterprise business as Microsoft does. So clearly, they have to build it from scratch. And they're focusing more on the AI side of things, rightfully so. And in this case, uh, some of the deals are lumpy. So I wouldn't make a lot out of the miss last night. I know everyone uh, focused on the 2 percentage point miss. But look, they are building this from scratch. And it's a, at a very healthy $32 billion run rate, growing at over 20, 25 percent. And to my mind, it's going to accelerate because they are one of the biggest buyers of GPUs as well. So where would you rent the GPU capacity besides Microsoft and Amazon? It's Google. Mandeep, I also want to talk a little bit about search because this line uh, from Microsoft's earnings caught my eyes that you take a look at Bing search and news advertising sales increasing 10 percent in the quarter. So it seems a little bit like advertising spend has stabilized. But when it comes to Bing versus Google, does Bing have any hope of taking serious market share from Google? Well, uh, I think Satya Nadella walked back his comments, uh, you know, during the testimony that he was aiming for share, but he conceded it's very hard to take take share from uh, Google. And uh, Google's results last night showed that at a $180 billion run rate, if you're growing double digits, that just goes to show how much power uh -huh. you have, where Snapchat grew 5%. Uh -huh. It's much smaller. Uh -huh. and, and I think uh, you uh -huh. get to see where the ad pricing power lies in the did, ecosystem. Did, did Greifel get the memo that we're Bing free? We don't talk Bing about, we don't don't talk talk about, about Bing, Bing here. Well, you we know. talk about Bing all the time. Well, I, I lasted <laughs> almost an hour. Pick it up, Katie. See if you can do better okay, in the well, next let's five see. Are we allowed to talk about Snapchat? I don't know. But let's talk about Snap. You know, because they, they make great tools. They're out of Ohio, oh, and I love right. their socket wrench. Continue. They have my AI. Okay, let's talk about Snapchat, because they came out with earnings. <laughs> the shares spiked 15% mm -hmm. uh, after hours. Now you take a look at shares. They're actually, I don't know, down slightly. What were we so psyched about at around 4 p.m. yesterday that we're not excited about at, what, 6.53 in the morning? I mean, clearly uh, the top line print was better than expected, but when it comes to the guidance, <laughs> The EBITDA number is the key for a company like Snapchat because they keep losing money. So because they had a positive EBITDA quarter, everyone thought it's going to continue. But in their guide, they were quite vague about where the leverage is going to come from. And it was just too uncertain to figure out whether this is sustainable or not. But it goes to this question, this larger question, of how the market is measuring the performance, the response. And you talked about how you actually disagree with the response to the Google uh, to the yeah. Google earnings, that you think people are overplaying the slight miss and mm -hmm. they're underplaying the potential for AI. Does that mean that right now, just from a market perspective, any results that show you the money are the ones that are going to be rewarded, not the ones that show you hope, which is what some people were really trading on with the AI promises of yore. Yeah, I mean, results matter. And in Google's case, there was an operating <coughs> income miss as well. But they are investing. And I, with Google, I see you know YouTube being a very big business. In fact, YouTube subscription growth has accelerated past all the streaming players. So that live NFL content is working. Cloud is another driver. Search remains robust. So the durability of earnings is there with a name like Google. Yes, they may have a bad, you know, a slight miss when it comes to operating margin, but it doesn't change the fact that they've got all these large businesses with a, a long runway. And, and yeah. I think that's the thing to focus on. Can you extrapolate out to Apple here? I believe it's November 2nd, whatever day that is. If we saw Microsoft do what they do, are we going to get the same joy, the same completeness as Tyler Radke talks about? Are we going to get that? from Apple? Very unlikely, given the, what's going on with China and their sh uh, focus on moving the supply chain. And look, uh, they're a hardware company. So we know uh, PC and smartphone markets are still bottoming out. So they will not have a big <coughs> quarter. And the one risk factor for Alphabet, going back to that, is if Apple decides to do their own large language model on the phone and take out the distribution they have for Google, which has come under scrutiny, that's a big risk for Google a search. I mean, other than that, I don't see any risk for the business. But if Apple decides to do their search and maps and everything, yeah. uh, large language model, that's a big risk. Mandeep, thank you so much. I got I gave more questions. Mandeep Singh with us. We'll have him on here over this arc of these tech earnings uh, as well. Lisa, I, I just was flabbergasted the completeness of the micros. Usually there's one dog division. You know, there's something that... Sandbag know, was Hermes different. had silk scars, didn't move. Somebody, was, the, the, the cognac, LVMH, the cognac didn't move. Right, exactly. When Microsoft, <clears throat> everything moved. The sandbag
sandbagging. I like that. And basically, yeah, well, they just sort that's... of quietly come up, like, boom. <laughs> that's goes, the, ah! the street experience of Mandeep Singh. Let's talk down earnings so we look good. I'm shocked. Red and green on the screen. Evix 19.17. Must watch. Katie Kaminsky next. Transitions aren't easy. The bear steepening that we've seen in the curve over the past several weeks and months has really driven everything. Eventually, you will have to refinance at these much higher rates, and that's the reality of higher for longer starting to bite. Markets have started to price in these different expectations for bond markets. Okay. Investors are looking for any glimmer of hope to start a end of year rally. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Bloomberg Surveillance, Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Abramowitz, and Tom Keen on radio, on television, at Worldwide. Farrow, sabbatical, or sojourn, or something like that. We'll get a report from John Farrow here <laughs> at some point. Katie Greifeld, the short straw this morning, uh, is joining us here with all these different narratives on. And I'm just going to cut to the chase for Global Wall Street. Must listen. Katie Kaminsky with us in about four minutes. This is on trend-based technical analysis, and her note is bliss on the risks that are out there. Lisa, what's the chief risk this morning? Well, the chief risk uh, right now is earnings, and that's what I think we're seeing, is that specific stock by stock will set a narrative for the specific stock, and you're getting divergent stories within the tech space. <clears throat> the fact that we're talking about that is wonderful after being whipsawed by the 10-year for about three months, and everybody was just talking about the 10-year yield, so I'm trying to shift to something else and hoping that maybe these other hoping. stories will uh, come to the fore a little What's bit What's the hope in the bond market? Tell me what you've seen in the credit space your expert on because we had price down, yield up, and we have had a little recovery. And I would editorialize under no technical veracity at all. We're just in a nowhere land. At this point, people are looking for stability more than yields coming down. Mm. That will be enough to generate some sort of feeling of comfort. <clears throat> Even if uh, yields level out at this level, it will be okay as long as things are stable. The instability right. is what left people very concerned because it creates a whole host of existential questions about whether right. the bid is walking away. The existential question, folks, is a 10 a.m. meeting this morning. The real yield, look for that on Friday. Let's get a pre-brief here. Katie Greifeld, you know, I look, I look at where the inflation adjusted yield is right now. It speaks volumes. What's it say to you? I mean, you look at the 10-year real yield right now, we we're clocking in at 2.44%. We're talking about the highest levels in more than a decade. And I think to Lisa's point, I mean, for the past few months, really, it's been both rate of change and the level that's been shocking. Maybe if we can get rate of change to calm down a little bit, we can actually digest the level. But the levels are pretty amazing as calculus well. Calculus with Greifeld this early in the morning. <laughs> well, I mean, the the market has been hinged to calculus because they don't know what other mooring to really go to. You should see Calculus 101 at Haverford. It is unbelievable that they're, they're all half asleep. Everybody's wearing Birkenstocks. I, uh, and, I, and did, then, I did not do well in you, Calc 101. You didn't, you didn't do Newtonian Calculus no, at Haverford No, I was, I was in Baby ago. Calc. A baby Calc. Baby okay, calc. well, there's, there's where we are. We're going to do a morning brief here. First on the date, I really want to emphasize it is that no man's land, if you will, the 10-year yield 4.86%, 30-year bond under 5, 4.98%. Uh, percent is, is Katie mentioned and she knows this is what I'm glued to you're up two basis points on the real yield this affects everyone in America 2.44 percent Elisa you're talking about Torsten Slack 10 percent small business loan expense which is just basically unthinkable. The small businesses are getting hammered by this uh, more than most, which has raised a real question for the central bankers who are hearing from those small businesses <laughs> and hearing about that pain and keeping rates where they are and potentially raising them even further. 10 a.m., we get the Bank of Canada rate decision, and the expectation is to hold rates <laughs> at around 5 percent, but with a hawkish tone. This is the new kind of expectation from central banks. Tomorrow is the ECB. 1 p.m., Katie, to your point, I am watching this closely. Every single auction is incredible 
incredibly important. The U.S. Mm -hmm. Treasury is planning to sell $52 billion to five-year notes. This is where the real uncertainty has come from, the fiscal overhang. Yeah, I mean, if you think about that 30-year auction we got, what, two weeks ago, it was so sloppy, a tale of 3.7 basis points or something like that. Be uh, interesting to see if the short end is any better received, but those auctions are definitely top of mind. The technicality of that is something we're going to be speaking about with Katie in just a minute. And today, after the bell, we get Meta and IBM. Meta and IBM sort of show Facebook. the two tales of the loved and the unloved in the tech space. Facebook, parent company at least, 160% gain uh, so far this year. IBM lower mm -hmm. by 2.2%. How much is this trading on a hope and how much is this trading on true fundamental strength oh, that could be representative of economic momentum? I, I, I got to admit, I mean, Farrell picked this. I, I, I had no, I did not see this coming. My basic idea is, is IBM the one that should have changed its name. <laughs> you know, International you know, business machine? Very, very good. The genealogy clicks in. I Googled in. everything she Googled on the everything. rundown. <laughs> okay, welcome to my act. Uh, Katie Greifeld giving us grief this morning. Farrell would never do that. Uh, this is right now for Global Wall Street, the interview of the day. Everybody's fundamental base, Katie Kaminsky, is weaned on the technician technical uh, analysis of trend going back to the giant Wells Wilder of 1978. She's with Alpha Simplex. Katie, an opening question. What's a trend right now in equities? So equities right now, we finally see some of our signals tick short net, which kind of is surprising to me. And second of all, the biggest trade and biggest thing to follow, and this goes with what Lisa is saying, divergence. We've seen long signals in big tech, mega cap, and we're seeing short signals in the small cap. That right. tells the consumer the average stock is, is in trouble. Your big high names, right. they're doing well, but your average stock is worried about higher rates. Katie Kaminsky and I studied Tisha Shande on beta. I'm not a big believer in beta for those of you from Global Wall Street. Katie, in this world, do you have to do beta as a sector study or index study, or can you actually have the conceit and confidence to do beta on individual securities? So we tend to think about looking at sectors because we're trading more in the futures markets, but we do also look at some of cash equity strategies as well. And we're definitely seeing tilts right now. You're seeing people talking a lot more about tilts to defensive, uh, tilts towards oil companies. So right now, I think this divergence trade is about finding certain areas of the market that are going to do better or worse in a higher rate environment. But it is tricky because it's uncharted water. We haven't really figured out what's going to happen next. That's pretty much the theme we're thinking and seeing is that we got to the higher rates. What's next? Which stocks are going to succeed, which are going to be able to refinance, which are going to waver through this new environment? Katie, I was so excited to speak with you today because you follow trends, and I'm looking for a trend in the 10-year yield. And yeah, it's up, but it's also, you know, we've been talking about a ping pong ball. Pick your, uh, pick your, your, your metaphor. How can you find a trend in a market that's unanchored? Mm -hmm. Good, good question. I've been asking this myself as well, because we have seen consistent short trends for months. I have still yet to see a steepener in the relative positioning and trend signals. That's something that I've been kind of looking for to understand when we might have an inflection point. There was a little bit more pressure on the long end this month, which is something that kind of brought my attention to the fact that we might be eventually at a buying point. It does feel right now in terms of how we're seeing the markets trade, that we're at a point where there's some interest to buy because we've, because we've come so far in this disinversion in the yield curve. Um, and so I think the next step is going to be, what's the next phase of this bond trade? Is it wait and see and see if we see something that could push us to a new shape of the yield curve? Or do we go to a state where we have worse financial conditions and we have to actually tighten, uh, stop tightening and thus see, um, you know, the shorter end has to release some of the pressure. Are you still short bonds? Yes. OK, so are you basically <laughs> seeing this as a sign that there could still be more uh, yield increases to come, even though you are seeing a bid to buy come in around the margins? 
Yes, Lisa, and what's amazing to me is that signals in the technical space have been short in fixed income for two years, almost consistently. That hasn't happened in many decades. And I think what we need to start to see is to see some consolidation and see some actual view that that trade might turn around. But so far, I keep looking for it, and I haven't seen the end of this trade yet. Um, so that suggests that we haven't seen the bottom of perhaps the long end of the bond market as of yet, I think we might see it in the next three to six months. So maybe yields have more room to climb here, but can we talk about the importance of 5%? Because I think it was very telling that you had the 10-year Treasury yield just kiss 5% earlier this week and then immediately drop. In the path to higher yields, how much of a hurdle will 5% be? Well, 5% was a pretty important philosophical boundary for many investors, and maybe it also represents a buying point. If you think about it from the investor perspective, as yields go up, there starts to be more and more of a trade-off between at what point um, do you not worry about the entry point of that particular investment, and you start saying, it's actually pretty good to lock in 5% over these horizons, and there is some risk that we might have deteriorating financial conditions, so purchasing those bonds might it actually seemed like a good idea. And that's what I'm hearing from investors as well. We're starting to see more discussions about the trade-off for the risk of investing in risky assets versus the return of fixed income that has become so much more, um, more interesting than it mm. was uh, a few years ago. Well, we're talking about the level here. Let's talk about rate of change a little bit, because the rate of change has been shocking over the past few months. You look over through the next few months, are things going to calm down? Well, I think these things come in spurts and in runs. And I think we've gone through a pretty strong run in terms of trends. And one thing that we note in the trend falling space is that fixed income is not linear. It tends to accelerate very quickly when it wants to, and then it can be very smooth for some period of time. It feels like we've gone through one of those phases, and now there's going to be some consolidation until we see something that has the ability to move that, that curve again. Um, so far, we need to have something a little bit more extreme, perhaps some deteriorating financial conditions or um, just an excess supply of treasuries that just has difficulty, um, yeah. you know, kind of consolidating. Katie, okay, don't run away. We're going we're gonna to do some data checks here. I want to come back to you with an important question on Alpha uh, Simplex. Uh, S&P futures in negative 11 here. The VIX 19.06 really shows the good news of the last couple days. Maybe Microsoft will help out with that this morning. 210 spread, negative 23 basis points. Katie Greifeld uh, looking at 2.45 percent on the 10-year real yield. Uh, that's extraordinary. We have some dollar strength, some resiliency. Uh, I don't know what Japan's doing. I got a 149.92 and a frozen yen, frozen fixed peso as that country falls apart. And the 10-year yield 4.86 uh, percent uh, as well. Any number of other statistics we've got. The two-year yield 5.09 percent. The Standard & Poor's 500 down three tenths of a percent. And Tom, I also think it's important. You said dollar uh, strength. I would say euro weakness because we have considered, continued no. to see euro weakness uh, as a significant uh, as a significant driver of that right. pair. That's a cross asset nature of it. With Katie Kaminsky here for Global Wall Street, I've really got to ask this question right now. Katie, your world is the foundation of Andrew Lowe of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He founded Alpha Simplex. He's a giant of my world and Global Wall Street's world. What does he make of a 10 standard deviation move in the bond market? As Lisa mentions, the level, the magnitudes, they're not in Andrew Lowe's textbooks, are they? Or in modern portfolio theory? So these type of events are what the adaptive markets hypothesis would call a punctured equilibrium. Um, I like to call them, for sort of more colloquial terms, an aha moment. Uh, it seems like occasionally investors come around and realize that they hadn't realized something relatively important. And I think what happened earlier this year is people realized, wow, I can actually earn something on my savings. And then recently, people finally learned that, wait a minute, 
we're going to actually have to deal with higher interest rates. And that was the recent uh, aha moment that we've had. Yeah. And so I think what's hard is that we all learn that markets are efficient. But unfortunately, these type of events, particularly in the bond market, seem to be very, very extreme. Right. And we seem to learn them very quickly yeah. and sort of all decide the same thing at the same time. And oftentimes it's very obvious ex post. Right. Katie, um, and, got to yeah. leave it there. But Katie, thank you so much. The wisdom there of Alpha Simplex and Professor Lowe of MIT. Coming up, further wisdom from Chicago, the 8 o'clock hour, James Bianco. From New York, this is Bloomberg Surveillance. Sadly enough, we've gone through many, many uh, individuals. I did not personally think uh, McCarthy needed to be taken out. The eight who did that, um, I, I just think they caused a lot of chaos. Mike Johnson was the runner-up to Tom Emmer. I think Mike would do a fabulous job. I think he could get the 217. Same with Kevin Hearn. Um, those two individuals, I think, uh, let's just say it's kind of it's insane to say, but they wouldn't have as many people against them. The gentleman from North Carolina getting through this. You wonder what I'll have to say tomorrow in 24 hours. And I gotta, I gotta say right now. I mean, welcome to surveillance here, Farrell. On a, he's on, you know, he's got an umbrella in the the Bloody Mary. This one, mm. Katie Gray fell oh, in yeah. for John Farrell, Lisa Bramwitz, and Tom Keen. And can I just say the only thing dumber than what's going on in the House is the Red Sox are trying to pick a new head of baseball operations. That's the only thing on the planet more silly than what we're seeing and in Washington. And it probably won't be as uh, raucous and as confusing as what's going on in the House. There's this question, and a viewer wrote in, and it's a good one. Are we now looking at a Trump litmus test for any potential well, additional House Speaker candidate? Because that seems to be what torpedoed yeah, Tom Emmer. Yeah, I'll go with that. But, you know, to open the conversation, he is the presumptive nominee. Am I, am I, I mean, you got to listen to the guy. I mean, I, I would think so. I mean, it's amazing to think of the Tom Emmer experience four hours as nominee, a word from Trump, and he's gone. I, it's amazing. If you are just joining and you're not caught up in this House Majority Whip, uh, Tom yeah, Emmer was the Farrell. front runner. And then all of a sudden, hours after he was the front runner, he uh, pulled out of the race after <coughs> former President Trump said, said, no, 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 he's, no. He's a Republican so. in he's name a only. He's a hockey and player in name him. only. And yeah. then now we have Mike Johnson of Louisiana, a Trump supporter, next in line for the we're, beauty pageant. We're going to get briefed on this uh, right now. We do this with a mixed market as what I would say, look to our ECB coverage uh, tomorrow. Joining us in Washington, our Bloomberg, you got to be kidding me, correspondent, Anne-Marie Horton, the starlet of uh, uh, balance of power. Who has the balance of power in the House right now, Anne-Marie? Well, looks like Mike Johnson has it, doesn't it? I mean, I will say one thing. This is the 22nd day that we do not have a speaker for the House of Representatives, but there is a different feeling, mood-wise, about Mike Johnson when there was this roll call vote last night. Three individuals voted present. There were about two dozen that were absent. This is potentially where he can have problem. But there does seem to be some momentum. Maybe it's the exhaustion amongst the Republican conference. Maybe it's not that he's not liked he's liked, but it's probably more so that he's not hated so much, that this could be right. one individual that unites them and gets to 217 on the floor, which has been the question and the problem the entire time. They have such a slim majority. Their caucus right. is so divided between the hard right and still moderates that remain in the Republican Party that it's very difficult for one individual to get to 217. Emory, your work in continental Europe and out of London, what is the effect of this silliness on our Western allies? I think they just look at this and it, they feel like we're here again. They saw a lot of um, tumultuous politics during the Trump administration. Uh, I think they feel that it'll get worked out. But when I was in New York for the UN General Assembly, someone quipped to me that it's no longer the rest of the world. Maybe that changes today, given what's going on in Europe as well as the Middle East. But a lot of consternation and stress that people feel around the world, whether it's heads of states or whether it's CEOs, actually emanates from Washington, D.C. They can no longer ex feel like they know what's coming out of D.C. Um, there are surprises, like there was last night. So I'm going to take a cue from uh, the viewer who wrote in and said, are we looking at a Trump test that any potential nominee uh, has to get passed? 
I think it has been clear from Tom Emmer really going down in flames, let's say. I mean, he had, what, the nominee uh, just for hours, and then he dashed off into an uh, SUV after basically Trump ended it put out a statement saying he's a globalist rhino. Politico's reporting that Trump got on the phone with someone and said, yeah, I killed him. Uh, without the backing of the former president, this individual was not going to be able to get to that suit 217, Tom Emmer, on the House floor. When you look at Representative Johnson from Louisiana, this is someone who is such a staunch Trump ally. This is an individual that actually was collecting the signatures for an amicus brief for a long shot um, case in Texas that they wanted to bring up to overturn election results. So someone that not just didn't just certify the election, um, but also someone that was actively working to support the former president in his quest. Emory, how politically viable is it for some of the more moderate Republicans to get behind a figure like that? Well, this is what my question really is today. There is the mood music and the shift does seem like it's changing, the feeling. But on the floor, can these individuals actually vote for him? I would note that one CNN reporter did tweet a photo of Speaker McCarthy's office and that sign that said Speaker McCarthy was taken down last night. So that is why you are seeing this big shift in tone. But there are 18 Republicans in the current caucus that are from Biden-led districts. So is this individual too toxic for them? This person is not as nationally known as, say, a Jim Jordan. So potentially they can get through with voting for him. Well, Anne-Marie, on the topic of Kevin McCarthy, it's striking to me just how different this experience is than the Kevin, Car Kevin McCarthy episode when we went through, what, something like 15 rounds. Now we're just going through nominees. Why the change in strategy? Well, Kevin McCarthy went through 15 rounds on the House floor, and I think that that a lot of Republicans that were able to get the nominee, I mean, Steve Scalise didn't even take it to the floor. Even though they're able to get the majority within their caucus, when they start to then make those phone calls and figure out, are they going to have more than four people vote against them? Steve Scalise realized, I'm not going to take it to the floor, whether one round, 15 rounds, it's not going to be me. Jim Jordan actually did right. take it to the floor, but it didn't work for him in a number of rounds. Um, so I think what they saw Kevin McCarthy go through, they realize that maybe it's best. Mm -hmm. I figure this out behind closed scenes. But also, now we are months in. That was January. This has gotten personal for a lot of people, and the battle lines have been drawn for a lot of these people, right. and they've hardened. So you have a really good feeling of whether or not you're going to make it through before you take it to the floor. Amber, you had Dr. Murphy on last night. You and Joe Matthew on Balance of Power had on the gentleman, 3rd District, North Carolina, as well. He's a urologist. He's the real deal. He's got all sorts of academic credibility. To President Trump, are there southern rhinos? I mean, Emmer is up from the, the deep liberal northeast of uh, Minnesota. Are there southern rhinos? Is Murphy, who you had on last night, is he a rhino to the Trump Republicans? I think someone like Representative Murphy is really just one of these individuals that wants to get behind the majority. So if the caucus and the majority decides we're going for Jim Jordan, he's going to go for Jim Jordan. If they decide they're going for Johnson, he's going to go for Johnson. He's someone that wants to see the place legislate again, and he's going to go for the individual that he thinks can get to 217 on the floor. And he made that very clear yesterday. He thought maybe it would be her, and he thought maybe it would be Johnson. He wants to go for someone who can get to 217 on the floor. Um, I would say that's someone who doesn't is not trying to get involved in this fight. Maybe these individuals yeah. want to get involved in policy fights, but there's some that really want to stay stay out of this. While there's others that, um, you know, it's it's a great moment also to make a name for yourself, and they're going to get yeah. involved. Emory Horton, thank you so much. Our Bloomberg cacophony correspondent in Washington. Of course, look the balance of power is day by day this torture uh, goes by. On my screen, it's a Bloomberg professional service, folks. We look at equities, we look at bonds, we look at currencies. Greifeld nailing it earlier. The unspoken here rounded up 2.46% on the inflation-adjusted real yield. When does small business in America collapse? I'm not, I'm not exaggerating there. When is there 
a collapse. Well, and this is what you're seeing on the margins, and this is what we saw in the Beige Book. And I know some people read the Beige Book, and they found a lot of anecdotes in there that pointed to potential weakness. This is what is possibly going to keep the Fed on hold. We haven't seen it, though, yet, because the economy is growing at an accelerating clip. Well, it's maybe two countries. We'll have to see on that. Coming up from BNY Mellon, Sonia Meskins. Stay with us. Bloomberg Surveillance. Surveillance from New York on radio and television. John Farrell on assignment. Lisa Bramwitz and Tom King. Catherine Greif Greifeld in for us uh, today. We, we, we will get the bid. I've had like four or five emails. I mean, none of the <laughs> economics, finance, who cares? Who cares? Just, just you know, Bitcoin. Just whenever you want to go ball. there. The I'm Bitcoin, ready. we'll get to it. You know, she's sick of talking about it, but we don't care. We're, <laughs> seriously, we'll do something on, on is it Sam Bankman Fried? Did I get that right? The Sam Bankman Fried story. We're going to do that uh, here in the 8 o'clock hour. Actually, some really good work by, by Bloomberg uh, on uh, that. Uh, red and green on the screen. The VIX 19.04, all quiet on the Western uh, front. Uh, dollar a little bit stronger here as well. Yen won't go through 150. Euro won't go through 106. ECB tomorrow, is it, Lisa? Yep. 121.29 and, and sterling. Well, the reason Farrell can go away like this and live large is he's paid in sterling. He's made a fortune. Well, this is part of the deal of in order to get the crews off the ground that you're planning on hosting is well, that he has know, to be able to test out a whole different number of places. He's going to scope it out. Yeah, he's going to scope it out. Uh, this is coming out right now. We're doing this breaking news, which is totally unfair uh, to the control room. Amy's okay. She's waking up in the control room right now. Boeing uh, out with earnings. It'll be interesting, uh, Lisa, to see how Boeing readjusts off of legit competition from Airbus. Yeah. All it's not sudden. Boeing Supreme anymore, is well, it? And they actually missed a bit, and you can see the shares dipping. We're going to talk more about that, but it really bleeds yeah. into the slew of earnings that we've been getting pretty steadily. I do want to talk about some other issues under surveillance this morning. Uh, really does focus on what's going on overseas. President Joe Biden speaking with Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman about wow. efforts to ease tensions in the Middle East, according to the White House. This is interesting. It's the first time they've talked uh, since Octo before October 7th. At the same time, Tensions flaring at the United Nations. The Israeli ambassador calling on Secretary General Guterres to resign after he said that attacks by Hamas earlier this month did not, ha quote, happen in a vacuum. Yeah. I mean, it just sort of feels like all of these different factions are trying to prevent escalation but can't really coalesce and around a shared vision. My take on this, and you, you're correct, the flaring is the exact perfect word. In Europe, this made major headlines. I mean, this was right at the top of the fold digitally. The fold came Catherine is when there's a newspaper and you fold mm. the newspaper. Over. I've heard of those. You've heard of that. Yeah. Good. Newspapers are Ancient folds. history. <laughs> I will what say, else do you have? No, but it's true. And I mm. think that this, I will just say, yes, it's got a lot of news, but it also highlights how this is a war of information in addition to it being very much yeah. on the ground hot mm. war. Over in the war of information in Washington, D.C., Congressman Mike J uh, Johnson of Louisiana is the latest Republican nominee for Speaker of the House. The move comes after Tom Emmer's bid ended shortly after he was criticized by former President Trump on social media yesterday. Johnson, another Trump ally, will look to become speaker with a vote set for noon Eastern. We already just talked about this with Anne-Marie, but I would love your take, Katie, on how much you hear about this as one of the features behind the volatility and the long end of the yield curve. I know that sounds nuts, mm -hmm. and yet people are looking for some compass to understand how we're going to resolve some of the deficit concerns. I mean, you think about all the drama that's playing out at the long end. That's definitely a feature because, again, we're heading into mid-November. We're pretty much at the tail end of October. Shutdown risk is real here. Fiscal deficits, supply concerns, it's all playing out at the long end. And it feels like bond investors are just looking for any reason to worry right now. Well, they have lots of them, and that's the reason why I have always kind of empathized with people <laughs> who focus on bonds. Meanwhile, in the earnings space, Alphabet and Microsoft heading in opposite directions after reporting earnings. Alphabet down in pre-market trading as its cloud business missed profit expectations. Microsoft gaining on growth in cloud computing and demand for artificial intelligence. Meta next up after the close. Amazon. Amazon reporting tomorrow. Yes, at this point, Tom, 
how much is this going to be about actual cash coming in the door, especially well, because you're actually earning something on that cash, which is suddenly yeah. something people are pointing to as a possible tailwind with higher rates for big tech. Yeah, what's important here is, is the understory, and Bloomberg's Robert Schiffman's done great, great work on this, is the underbonding of these cash-rich companies. Robert Schiffman looking at Microsoft, for example, with it's it's it's, it's a heavy burden, folks. 1.9% debt weighting. Well, 1.9%. Okay. There isn't a textbook that says you should do that. Why issue debt when you have this much money? And oh yeah, by the way, you can actually take this money, park it in T-bills and earn 5% on that cash. So that's the thing. I mean, it feels like the narrative has been that you see higher interest rates, that's bad for long duration tech companies. You think about the debt actually on their balance sheets, that's not necessarily the case. Then you take a look at the cash piles. They're making money off of that. Alphabet's interest income uh, almost doubled to more than $1 billion. We learned that yesterday. It's pretty amazing. Well, and this to me is ironic because we were talking about how higher rates will hurt big tech because of valuations and now suddenly, wait a second, they've got a lot of cash and they're actually <laughs> going to earn something. So you could flip it on its head. It seems like tech wins. Heads yeah. they win, tails they well, you know, don't what lose. What do you do? I mean, this is way back with Grateful Dead records. Doug Cass knows this. You go in and there's a whole row of, of bootleg Grateful Dead records. And the answer is there's a point where you bought incense there, you little candles and other, and you burnt your incense in your dorm room as you study Modigliani and Merton theory, Merton and Modigliani theory, excuse me, which was on capital structure. And basically it said, if you've got the money, issue bonds. And it's, it's, it's fascinating to see what companies like Microsoft uh, do here. Are they going to just completely ignore Merton and Medigliani? That's the heart of the matter. Patchouli? Was Patchouli. It Patchouli? Yeah, I can't pronounce it, though. Or was it, I mean, was it something else, the scent? Uh, I guess I'm just too far, the, you know, too far ago to remember. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's where we are. Uh, very importantly, Boeing. This is the Airbus competition as well. They cut their annual target for 737 uh, jets. Some free cash flow headlines out there uh, as well. It's interesting to see uh, the challenges Boeing has in a true global uh, duopoly. She studied at the London School of Economics, not aviation uh, manufacturing, but Sonia Meskin is U.S. macro at BNY Mellon, understands international processes and joins us this morning with her wonderful work at the International Monetary Fund <coughs> on the Green Book long ago and far away. What is your biggest mystery in international economics now? You have to write for BNY Mellon. You're beginning to plan a year-end report. What's the single biggest mystery you have in international economics? You know, I think what we're all trying to figure out right now, uh, maybe this is my central banking background, but the infamous R star, what is the appropriate level of rates for this economy? What is the appropriate level of policy rate? And I think it's not just the U.S story. I think it's a global story um, because the dynamics in, the, in inflation, in supply and demand globally have shifted. So this is sort of building on what Katie Kaminsky was talking about. How do you follow a trend if we can't find it? How do you follow some sort of narrative if nobody can really figure out what to look at? What's your compass when trying to understand what the new paradigm is globally? Well, I do think that you, st you, start, you start by looking at, well, how much are people saving? Where is the savings coming from or no longer coming from? And where is the investment side coming from today? And we do think that the balance between aggregate savings and investment has shifted. So we have fewer savers, especially in the U.S., as you know, people age out of the workforce. So they start saving less in America, especially, and they start spending more. Um, and on the other side, we do have more investment. You would in manufacturing even. You know, folks were so worried about manufacturing at the start of this year and even late last year. And we're having a rebound, in part because there's this shift from private spending, or used to be at least, into to public spending. Now we have all this fiscal support for manufacturing, and, you know, the sector is doing well. This is fascinating to me. We were talking about all those retirees packing out all their cash in their savings accounts, and all of a sudden, they're getting to retirement, and they're spending it. They're putting it out there in a new way. The new generation, it's YOLO. You only live once. They're spending it. How much does that increase R-Star from your vantage point? I mean, how much does that increase 
face both growth and inflation in a level that we haven't really envisioned? Well, it's important to not only look at the savings side, but also as we just discussed, the investment side, because I do think inflation is a function of both of those, right? Because not only do you have fewer savers, people are spending more on the consumer side, but you also have more investment. And Sonia, I want to bring you into the conversation that Lisa and I were having about who higher interest rates actually pinches in the equity market. Because again, the narrative has been that it's those big tech companies, those long duration cash flows that are going to get hit the hardest. That hasn't been the price action so far this year. Who actually gets hurt from these higher rates? I do think the small businesses a lot more because, listen, they're much more exposed, as you guys just discussed. They're much more exposed to higher rates. They do still employ. Uh, a good chunk of the American workforce, almost 50% by some estimates. And, um, you know, for tech companies, I think growth expectations in light of AI have really been ratcheted up. Uh, whereas for the small businesses, of course, um, you know, not only the financing costs are higher, but also the growth expectations are lower. Well, talk to us about refinancing risks and sort of the fact that these small cap companies, they have to tap the debt market a lot more frequently than their larger peers. You think about refinancing into this higher interest rate environment, how painful is that right now? I, I think for some, much more painful than for others, and it's really important to look at balance sheets. And again, the consumer and profile for each individual business is important as well, because it all comes back to jobs. If people have money to spend, or if they have enough savings, for example, or their net worth has risen considerably, as we know, that is a buffer. That is a buffer even for companies who need to refinance into higher rate environments. Because just as with the big uh, corporations, just as with tech stocks, if growth expectations still trump right. the cost of capital, they're in a good place. An Austrian named Hayek darkened the door at your London School of Economics. He would say you have to clear markets. I'm looking at bank charts. I'm looking at financial industry charts that border on grim. How do you perceive from an international economics basis we clear our busted financial system? Well, in some ways, um, you know, a yield curve that is somewhat less inverted is obviously helpful to banks. Um, another thing, of course, is um, loan demand. And I think that by some metrics, at least, actually, loan demand has been growing a little bit faster recently than earlier this year, which is an auspicious sign. I mean, from a high standpoint, it's a, it's a, it's a global roll-up is what we actually see here. The strong gets stronger. I mean, I don't see any other way about, out of it. But it's a once-in-a-lifetime bond move, isn't it? Yeah, it's huge. Certainly once in a decade. <clears throat> Okay, well, Sonia Meskin, thank you so much. With BNY Mellon, some difficult questions there, particularly if you're working for a bank of the character and longevity of the Bank of New York. Their dividend goes back to 1642. You know, we mentioned powder dry Cromwell earlier. <laughs> so that's the heritage. Bank Talking of New York. about the paradigms. They, they paid a shifting. dividend in 1642. Stuffison <laughs> cashed the first check. Who? Stuyvesant. <laughs> no, I know. I'm just kidding. No. I think, though, that there is this point about all of the older people who are retiring and then spending all the money and the younger people who believe well, that you only live that. once yeah. and the whole idea that everyone's spending yeah. and the incentive to save has gone down it's just so interesting to me because it's true St Yola. standard Poor's 500 negative 11 right now uh the standard Poor's 500 down three tenths of a percent will we get stability today in the 10-year yield that seems to be uh, the theme on everybody's mind and i yes. just keep going back though to this theme that we see developing whether it's katie kaminsky or whether there is Sonia Meskin about this idea that how do you solidify, how do you coalesce around a narrative when we don't know the new paradigm? And that is sort of the, the message of the past couple of weeks. It seems like what we have to rely on right now, to Katie Kaminsky's point, is these levels, 5%. That is a big philosophical level. And in this vacuum of Fed speak that we're in right now, of course, in the Fed's quiet it's period, just, I mean, that's, just, that's where we're trading. It's Actually, to be completely honest, Fed Chair Jay Powell is speaking today. But it is a non-monetary policy related conference. Okay. So What's it is a quiet about? period. I think he's introducing one of his former colleagues. So it's okay. not going to have to do with monetary policy, but it's not exactly quiet. It's like a, you know, whisper of a quiet. Well, then we're going to have to pay attention to the color of his tie. Oh, yeah. You know, oh, how God, his please, hair no. is That's why I didn't <laughs> mention that coming in. ECB tomorrow, we'll have coverage on that. John Farrell reporting from the back of a cruise ship. Uh, so I don't know where he is, somewhere. If you're on the stern of the ship and you're 
you're going up and down, you don't go up and down the same as if you're up top where you do this thing. Have you ever been on a cruise? I've been on a cruise exactly once. Yeah, and, and how long did it last? Said, don't make it twice. <laughs> you bother the captain, hey, can I drive, please? Uh, it's a long, it's a long story. You know, I got, is that Grace Kelly? You know, it was, it was you know, very cool. Star it's studded. Long, it was off Hawaii, long time. Long sort time of like ago. Jonathan Carroll. There you yeah. go. Yeah, well, John's out there, he'll be back. I, I believe rumored Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday. Monday. Or, Thursday. <laughs> I think so. On the American economy at 8.30, Stephen Rusciuto. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. When the bond market sets the, uh, uh, the stock market bouncing between gains and losses, look for babies that get thrown out with the bathwater. The good news is it's the end of free money. It's a normalization of interest rates. Bond buyers are getting something in return. We're leaving a period of emergency uh, uh, liquidity to a more normal environment. Uh, John Stolfis, he has been right on the market. He has been optimistic and is still invested, chief investment strategist at Opco, Oppenheimer Asset Management. Lisa, you know, all the gloom that's out there, they selected few, Minkram Chata over at Deutsche Bank, John Stolfus, you know, a number of other people that are saying, shut up, get in the market. I don't really feel the gloom. I mean, yeah. the gloom, I guess I feel from bond traders because they're always a little bit gloomy. And again, I relate, but at the same time, in the equity space, you hear people say, you know, <clears throat> if you've been gloomy, you've been wrong. Yeah. And you hear that again well, and again and again. Well, the fact of the matter is, we're still sitting on double digit gains. If you look at the S&P 500, you look at the NASDAQ 100, it's up something like 35% year to date. I know we've stalled out and then some in the last couple months, but it's still a good year. Yeah, but I'm looking at the select few, not only the seven that we're going to talk to Alex Webb about here in a moment, but we haven't talked about this this morning. We're going to pause for Global Wall Street and particularly Manhattan. You know, the banking business is below 60th, 59th Street. Did I don't you know that. that? I didn't know <laughs> you, that. You, you're, no. you're in his camp. <laughs> Citigroup. Right there. Citigroup. Yeah. 38.93 on a reverse split off of 2007 it's $3.89 you look at every chart in banking and you know forget John Stolfus's optimism Katie it's just slipping away yeah i mean financials they are their own special headache and there are some idiosyncratic issues i mean if you take a look at the sector level as well but i mean on the benchmark level if you're just putting money in your S&P 500 tracking fund you're still having a pretty good year well, okay, you can listen to her. I mean, she's a you know. pretty good year. I got Citigroup under $4 a share, reverse spit, Lisa. And what does that say about the regionals or the smaller banks as well? Yeah, big banks or utilities, yeah. regionals are uh, potential candidates for a roll-up. For the what? Zombie roll-up? Well, it's a zombie roll-up, but, it, I, you know, you never know the way it's going to be a roll-up. And a roll-up can be constructive, like the oil business that we've seen. People are basically saying Chevron sold Amarada Hess. I don't know if it's true or not, but that's sort of the zeitgeist out there is they didn't go to big premium. It's a different industry when suddenly yeah. you're looking at trying to maximize the stuff in the ground before suddenly it's obsolete. We're doing non-tech ch chat here before we go all tech. We can do that right now with Alex Webb in uh, London. Alex, your brief was exactly where I wanted to go, which is I'm fed up with a happy talk about AI. What did I learn about AI at 4 o'clock yesterday afternoon, New York time? I mean, in very simple terms, it is a real thing. There was a certain amount of questioning. We've seen all this spending on chipsets from NVIDIA to, to build up the data centers that are primarily built by the cloud operators. I'm talking about Amazon, Microsoft, and Google, as well as a few others. Now, they've been building up all this capacity and the expectation that their cloud customers are going to use it. If they build it, will they come? Looking at Microsoft, it looks like they are. There's a 300 basis point tailwind that it's got in the most recent quarter from demand for its AI offerings. And of course, its AI offerings are often to do with what uh, OpenAI, the maker of ChatGPT does. Microsoft is the biggest investor in ChatGPT. They have a very close relationship. There is appetite for that stuff. Interestingly, Google also reported earnings, good numbers when it came to the advertising piece, but in the cloud space, it did not do as well. The suspicion that maybe Microsoft has stolen a march in that AI space and Google is suffering. Have we used AI to paper over the nuts and bolts of these businesses too much? And I keep going Great back to the cloud question. and the fact that are we seeing Google lose share to the others and really break back to another place while the others surge ahead? 
Well, it's, it's, look, there's a lot of nuance in here, obviously, right? Google is by a long way the third biggest player in the space. Amazon dominates it with AWS. Microsoft is a strong second. Google is quite a long way behind. Amazon right now has not got the sort of AI offering that, that Microsoft and Google have. Microsoft, as I said, seemingly a bit ahead of Google, at least in the, in the customer perception. Google has a lot of these things. It's not making a difference. The really interesting thing will be to see whether chunks are being taken out of AWS by this AI play. That will help answer, I think, your question. But, you know, there's a huge amount of optimism more broadly about AI and what that does in general for the global, global economy. So it's not necessarily about paping over cracks so much as filling them in. And, uh, you know, that's a slightly different perception on it. But how much overlap is there with the cloud computing clients and the clients for the artificial intelligence services that are a pretty broad reach, right? I mean, isn't there basically consolidation of market share and corporate investment that you can translate from one section of the business over to the other? If I understand your question correctly, look, I think AI is going to be touching everything in all of these companies. There's, that is the huge expectation for AI. So the idea that it is just moving spending around, I think, may not be completely accurate. I think that if people want to find the savings and also the growth opportunities that AI might be offering, they need to be investing in it. That is probably going to be additional investment rather than reallocated investment. At the same time, Google, one of the reasons that its cloud business did not do as well as expected is because according to the CFO um, uh, Ruth Porat, there has been a little bit of tamping back on spending. So we are still very, very early in this cycle. There is going to be a lot more to come if you judge by the Microsoft experience, but they have to see that it is having the effect that they desire and the technology is not all the way there yet. And Alex, maybe for I a bit did, of I hope that did ask your question, I'm sorry. <laughs> My head's spinning, Katie, save us. Okay, well, I was gonna say, for a bit of a reality check, we were talking to Mandeep Singh earlier, and he made the point that, what, for Microsoft, AI went from a 1% contribution to a 3% contribution. How high could that number climb, theoretically? Well, I mean, you know, I, I'm not an analyst, I'm not in the business of making, like, those sort of, precise predictions, but you know, 3% of a $60 billion business isn't nothing, right? Mm. That is, that would make it a unicorn on a standalone basis, presumably. <clears throat> so, uh, it, 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 don't wanna, it's a cliche, the sky is the limit, right? We don't know <clears throat> how far AI can go, what it can do. The question is when, is it coming now? Is it coming in six months? Is it coming in five to 10 years? That's the key question okay. rather than knowing, just in general, how big it is. I mean, Alex, I make jokes about it, but you've been absolutely industry leading on this and brilliant at Bloomberg Opinion. So I'm reading Zachary Cavanaugh at Microsoft who's telling me why I need Microsoft Copilot at home. And he's got blah, blah, large language models, whatever they are, is as well. So they go, ask a work question. So I said, do we miss John Farrow? And, you know, that's what, that's what Copilot and I guess ChatGPT can do. When do we get questions like that answered effortlessly? Not this techo babble, but when can Lisa say, is it a toxic brew? Or, you know, how bad is a toxic brew? When are we going to get that in AI? Well, if you think about it, five years ago, GPT is... We've gone from GPT-1 to GPT-4 in five years, and GPT-4's capabilities are very impressive. GPT-1 struggled to pull, put sentences together, right? So if you look at that timeline and the pace at which it's accelerating, it's going to happen very, very soon. <laughs> The question is the safety element, and does that hold back the pace of the of the development? It's an important one. Yeah. It's one that people are trying to answer right now. Alex, thank you so much. Always learn something there. Alex Webb, there on like the, the more of the philosophy of what we're witnessing, not the financial uh, numbers there with Bloomberg opinion. I am and, curious though, what did Copilot say to that question? It crashed the damn server <laughs> in Arizona. Is is what it did. But Lisa, I mean, this is important. The people come on the show, Katie, and they go, "It's going to." help margins down the income statement by 200 beeps and I'm like really yeah that's what that's what's coming out of their mouths well and if you take a look at specific <coughs> businesses and I pointed to Moody's earlier saying that they were going to start using chat GPT to do what to help with some <laughs> of their ports reports to generate them if you can have when we were talking about <laughs> that was with Matt Lizetti of Deutsche Bank yesterday about how you could use chat GPT <laughs> to find certain things to go through documents really quickly why analyze fed meeting minutes if you can just 
send your chat GPT Why have after animals? This. Exactly. Well, this is the question, right? At what point does that replace humans versus uh, augmenting their productivity, which is another word also of cutting out some of the work? And maybe that eventually translates into margin help. But in the meantime, I mean, these companies are spending so much on AI and research and development that has to hit margins. Well, maybe, although it might be worth it if they can potentially get rid of hey, some promise. redundancies. I hate that. I've got smart people telling me that this is going to work in selected areas. But, you know, we make a joke about it. But are you going to be able to go, which is the toxic brew that matters today? And it's going to churn out. I just don't buy it. Maybe it's with less poetry. Another way of search, though. It's a more accurate yeah, search okay. function. So if you think about how much Google improved people's efficiency, some of us use Google to find information. Just imagine uh, how much more you can do. Exactly. I, I Googled that Euro about an hour ago. Sclerosis. But then it gives you a better, more curated history. I yearn for Lycos. Dogpile was there before Google. Google bought the algorithms of Dogpile. It's like, wow, you can do that? Alex Webb, brilliant there on what we see from Microsoft earnings this afternoon as well. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. Clearly, the consumer is holding up better than expected. The good news is it's the end of free money. Investors do expect some sort of a slowdown, but certainly not a collapse. Over the next several months, there is this backdrop where inflation could very well firm. They have to get inflation under control. We're not in that territory yet. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Waiting for knives to stop falling so you can jump back in from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Abramowitz. John is still on his cruise. Katie Greifeld very much with us today, which is a good and beautiful thing. Tom, this to me, you've been talking about the gloom. I see it the opposite way. The tone to me is waiting well, for a trend that could give you enough confidence to go buy big tech and everything else. The gloom is there and the confidence to buy big tech was witnessed by Microsoft yesterday. There's issues of seasonality here the time of year. But I don't make a small issue. We haven't talked about this. Is buybacks click in? I don't really understand the legality of it. But all of a sudden, everybody can buy their own shares. And, you know, they come out with their earnings. They all get done. They all go to some spa and, you know, do Zen and all that. They come back and they do bond issuance. I love and this. I just wonder if that's what we're going to see from West Coast Techie here. They're going to come back and do gazillions of dollars of bonds that they can sell with five phone calls. You come back from a cruise are talking about spa and patchouli. No, well, that's what they're burning. doing. They're, they're out there going on <laughs> and they're going to do, you know, $20 billion. Here's the thing. What you're seeing is immense cash flow. And what you're seeing from these yeah. tech companies is a rigor. And regardless of whether you want to parse through some of the nuances, as we heard from Mandeep Singh earlier, it's a really good picture. So at what point do you just wait for some narrative in the bond market to let you have some conviction with a narrative to drive forward some sort of buying thesis? Yeah, when things finally stabilize, then you stop obsessing over price return. You think about total return. You look at 5% on a 10-year Treasury yield. Think about the risk-reward there. It doesn't look too bad. At this point, though, we are wondering if we have seen stability. And, Tom, you were talking about calculus. Katie was uh, displaying some <laughs> earlier. But Just it really is. Killing. I mean, but this is the issue, right, is that we have had to deal with the calculus of a bond market that was stagnant well, for so <clears> long and suddenly uh, was a jump condition, to use your phrase. We're going to make jokes about this, but that's the heart of the matter, folks here into October, into the Fed meeting with our coverage here, I believe, the first day of November. And then it gets even more interesting into December. And it's about the rate of change. It's about the rate of change of the rate of change, the accelerative tendencies and the way they're linked together across equities, bonds, currencies, commodities. But then you get to uh, what we heard from BNY Mellon, the jump conditions, the true instabilities out there where it's a regime change. Which is maybe why we're getting more angst around the geopolitical situation as well as what's happening to net domestically. And Katie, I loved your question earlier when you said, what's more important next week? Mm -hmm. uh, what we hear from central banks, what we hear from earnings, what we get from economic data or the refinancing agreement, yeah. where the U.S. is going to be selling a lot more debt. Because if you rewind back to early August, it really things, feels like things have been super funky since we got that initial refunding announcement where the Treasury announced it was going to be selling more debt than the markets had been expecting. I know there's a lot of issues going along at the long end, but that seems to be really when things started to take off. And Tom, haven't you been surprised on some level that we haven't seen your zombie roll up yet? 
Oh, we've seen selected zombie roll-up, and what's fascinating to me is the mating in the oil patches of Exxon and Pioneer and Chevron and Amarada Hess. And I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, folks, it's not Hess, it's Amarada Hess, get over it. And, 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 the, and the answer is, is clearly the pros are telling me they were not done at a premium markup. People are mating not for financial gain, they're mating for scale because that's their least worst opportunity. And we are seeing the latest in that Stellantis, uh, this crossing just moments ago. Stellantis said to be near a deal to buy 20% stake in Leap Motor. We'll get you more on that in just a minute. Kind of curious, given some of the strike activity uh, going on as well. In the markets, softness, uh, a little bit of softness. It's hard to get too excited or too uh, depressed about this. Declines about a quarter percent. But what you can see is dollar strength, at least versus the euro, after some of the economic data that came out. Ten-year yields. Have have we reached stability? Tom, do you think so? Uh, I don't think so in the sense that on a technical basis, the damage was so great that we just have no idea, what, it depends on which way the line's going, but there's no support or resistance trend path to work with. It's a no man's land and, you know, it's a cop out, but it's true. I need more information. Which is the reason why people are waiting for some stability before saying, okay, I can actually cling on to uh, some sort of thesis. Someone who has been very good with this is Jim Bianco, president and macro strategist at Bianco Research. How much are you just waiting for the knives to stop dro uh, dropping before you can really go out there and have some conviction? Oh, I think that that's the key, is that you have to wait for the knives to stop dropping. And the problem is, is that everybody's been trying to catch them, and they've been calling into this trap over and over, or getting their hands cut, you know, over and over again, to stick with the metaphor. But I think what we forgot, and I've, in the, what I've seen in a lot of the discussion about the bond market was, 2009 to 2020 was the QE period. Let me say it bluntly, that was the abnormal interest rate. We have not gone up, I know we've gone up 500 basis points, but we have not tightened by 500 basis points. We haven't tightened by anything close to 500 basis points. The first several hundred or few hundred of that was just getting back to neutral. So the amount of uh, tightening or the amount of uh, stress that the interest rate market is putting on the economy, I don't think is as great as people think. Which is why tomorrow, when we get GDP, we're probably going to see a number that could very well have a four handle on it. And this is the same quarter that in June, right before it started, the consensus forecast was for zero. And we're starting to play that game again, that the economy is about to turn down yet again. We've done this now for a year that we keep saying this because the assumption is that these rates are punishingly high. If they're not, then there is room for them to keep going up. And I think that's what they'll do. Which is the reason why I sense a shift a little bit on the margins of the narrative, this feeling that if bond yields stabilize here, it's not Armageddon. It's not going to cause the demise of any kind of stock rally. But the opposite, that the stability will allow people to come in, buy equity, buy riskier securities, because the economy is withstanding these rates. Do you think that that is an accurate reflection of how people are thinking? Yeah, it is an accurate reflection that, you know, if things are not as bad as we hope, then, you know, earnings will come through, the economy will stabilize, companies will have a little bit of a brighter outlook. However, the, you got to also put that against the alternative. And the alternative is a 5.5% money market fund, and maybe very well in the next couple of weeks, a 5% bond uh, fund as well. Um, Dr. Jeremy Siegel updated his great book, Stocks for the Long Run, this year. There's a new edition out. And in it, he says that the long-term return for the stock market is 8%, you know, over many cycles, up and down many, many years. Well, if I get five and a half in a money market fund or five in a bond fund, I'm getting like half to two-thirds of the stock market's gain with no, with no real market risk or much reduced market risk. So the stock market's got to do something more than just oh, we beat our earnings and things are right. somewhat bright and everything's okay. They got to do better than that because there is an alternative now and it starts with a 5.5% money market fund. And Jim Bianco, the real yield where it is, and you're one of the few people I can talk to this about, you and I remember when there was a great specialty chemical roll-up. Everybody went out, ripped apart the companies that made chemicals and said, here's what's special. Let's, it's, it was basically a big zombie roll-up of some productive companies as well. Are we at a point because of a new real yield because of a new cost of capital permeating the system that we get a great merger thon I'm not so sure we're going to get a great merger yet because I think people are really misreading the real yields and they're not ready to 
really react on it because you hear this, you know, battle cry that real yields of two and a half percent on the 10 year tip is at the highest since 2009. Again, it's the highest since the QE period. What was the average real yield from 1997 when they started trading them to 2009? It was 2.7%. And we're at 2.5% right now. So I think once people start to recognize that these right. real yields are not punishingly high, you might start to see that merger activity start to pick up. But right now, everybody seems to want to wait for you know, yields to start back down. Earlier, you said, well, you know, we're going to see the tech companies start issuing bonds. Uh, if we did, that means that yeah. they think rates are going a lot higher. So I suspect the answer is no. Late October victory lap, Jim Bianco, folks, way out front of inflation at a level or even ticking higher, as we saw in parts of Europe as today. Bianco absolutely nailing that call. Does that signal that the great moderation is over? I think it is. I think that that. Uh, that era ended in 2020. You know, I've been on the show before and I've talked about that. 2020 was arguably the most important economic event of our lifetime, a complete shutdown and restart of the economy globally. And it has now been coming back differently than it was before. And that whole era of zero rates, the great moderation, um, and I would even maybe even talk about top down index investing on the equity side you know, might be changing. And now we're going to be looking at more traditional cycles of three, four year recessions. And we might be looking at stock picking, making a big return after 20 years of being in the wilderness, you know, versus uh, index funds. And we're going to have to start to understand that this is a very different environment. And Jim, we don't have a ton of time left, but I want to talk about the shape of the yield curve, because what we've seen so far when it comes to this twos tens is a bear steepening. Typically, it's the bull steepening. That's the recession signal. What signal is this bear steepening sending? That inflation is not yet behind us. If the Federal Reserve wants to back off of their rate hikes then the, and wants to say the market is going to do its work, be very, very careful, because when the market starts doing its work, it will do it. You want the market to slow things down, it will slow things down. Look last year in the UK, when, they did, when the market didn't like the mini budget and Parliament wouldn't do anything about it, the market stepped up and did something about the mini budget and Liz Trust couldn't last longer than a head of lettuce. So be very careful when you say, let the market do your work because it will do it and it will do it in a way that will right. scare you. And that's why we think we're getting a bear steepener right now. Ten more questions. We'll get to them. Jim Bianco, thank you so much with Bianco Research uh, for another time on some of the vicissitudes of the American financial system. Uh, Jim Bianco there, just on, you know, folding in the economics into the equity market as well. Speaking of the equity market, red and green on the screen, it's been that way all morning. Don't really know what to make about it other than we wait for tech earnings this afternoon. The VIX now under 19, 18 point. Uh, nine six, the two ten spread, negative twenty three. Not much. There's six basis points of dis inversion, but noise. Katie Greifeld nails it with the uh, ten year real yield two point four five percent higher real yield. The Standard and Poor's five hundred negative ten down two tenths of a percent. I love what Jim just said there. He was saying that he views twenty twenty as the biggest financial episode of our life. Did you shut the economy down, Tom? And then you well, started it, and it looks completely different. And that's where we are. Yeah, that's a pandemic. And the question is, are we along with that? We didn't have time to get to it uh, with a number of these guests, including uh, from BNY Mellon. But my missed call of the year was underestimating the legs and magnitude of fiscal stimulus. Olivia Blanchard talks about the Biden stimulus, that third, I believe, third tranche that we had. And I just completely misguessed the oomph of that. And through yeah. the year. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, the magnitude was there to see, but you think about the legs that it has, the fact that it's yeah. still having an impact, and you can see that clearly. I think that lasted a lot longer than many were expecting. Yeah, but at this point, that's the reason why it's interesting that despite 5% yields, which two years ago, if you had said anyone to anyone that's where we would be, they would say, yeah, well, I imagine that you know, 25% of the high yield market is probably in default. That's not where we are. That, to me, is really the takeaway because because of that strength and all of that savings. Yeah, you saw it in the banking system, those higher yields, the sharp increase causing a hiccup. We haven't seen that in the broader high yield market. I saw an amazing stat in a Bloomberg article yesterday, and I knew this, but it crystallized it like nicely. In three years, 10-year yields have increased four percentage points. I mean, that is just 
amazing. And we're still seeing a lot of resilience in the stock market, in the economy. Tom, I will just tell you this. A lot of people are writing in, where is Pharaoh? <laughs> where is Pharaoh? What well, is, you know, chat GPT. Yeah. Well, and, and what cruise is he on? That's what I'm trying to well, figure he out. he actually wanted to go I, to Antarctica I, 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 because he all wanted I know, to see the penguins. You know, you my go. head was, it was really high up. I could, it's like standing on a skyscraper. You could look out his room and see the port, and you could turn around and see the starboard. It was amazing. <laughs> this is Bloomberg. Good morning. Like the United States, want to prevent this conflict from spreading? Tell Iran, tell its process, in public, in private, through every means. Do not open another front against Israel in this conflict. Do not attack Israel's partners. The Secretary of State at the United Nations the Security Council ministerial meeting is well. He will no doubt have a busy day uh, today. Uh, Oliver Cook traveling today, but I'm sure we'll have more from him. And Ethan Bronner leading our coverage in Tel Aviv uh, this morning. Futures negative nine. Dow futures a little bit of green there. The oddity. I, I'm going to give that to Microsoft. We'll have to see uh, as well as an ad adjustment. Gregory Vellier of AGF Investments writes every morning. He says geopolitics could be, quote, the trickiest issue in next year, 2024, as public opinion, especially among young voters, seems to be shifting towards isolationism, the idea of spending another $100 billion on Ukraine and Israel. It's increasingly unpopular. Nevertheless, Biden has a political opportunity to become an effective wartime president. This with decent support in Congress. That from Greg Villiers and Lisa. This is something I've brought up. You've heard me like a broken record talk about America's history of isolationism and is now a, a demographic isolationism. And how much is that going to really play out, especially into the next contours of two front conflict, right? It's both in Israel and Ukraine. Greg Valliere joining us right now. I want to start there. Is there the political support to support Israel in addition? to Ukraine going forward through not just the next month, not just the next two months, but six months to a year? Well, that's the key question, isn't it? And I do sense over the last few weeks a waning of support. I think that Biden has enough backing in the Senate. I think he's got Mitch McConnell and Lindsey Graham and many others who uh, are very hawkish. But I'd say young people are not enthusiastic. A lot of Americans don't want to spend $100 billion more. So it's 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 soft, but I still think that Biden has enough support to get an aid package, probably not until the middle of the winter. Greg, what do you make of the fact that you're essentially getting uh, a Democratic Party that doesn't seem to back Israel and is actually moving away from it and a president that's trying to lead the charge in that effect? Well, it's quite a dichotomy. It's it's really uh, almost shocking to see the, the Democrats, the party that supported Israel so aggressively for decades and decades, now looking a little bit softer. I, I do think, though, that we will get a deal done. M my issue is the timing. I think we're still many weeks away for from anything new for Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan, uh, U.S. border with this, uh, uh, Mexico. That's still a ways off to, in terms of getting it uh, enacted. Well, Greg, walk us through the ramifications of that. If we don't get an aid package approved until mid-December, as you outlined, what would that mean for this war? I think it sends a very bad signal to our allies, at the least ambiguous, but I would argue it sends a, a signal that the U.S. is losing a bit of its resolve. You know, we all recall in the last year, year and a half, that was the big issue, that we would lose our resolve on Ukraine. Uh, if we lose our resolve on Ukraine and Israel, that to me sends a, a, a really negative signal. And let's tie this into what we're seeing play out in the House right now and the efforts to elect a speaker there. Because a week, two weeks ago, I would have asked if uh, the Israel-Hamas war would have put more urgency behind this process. But that doesn't seem to necessarily have materialized, Greg. 
No, it doesn't. I think this deadline of November 17th is going to come and go. I can't see them getting a budget done by the 17th. So the new speaker, if we get one, because nobody's ever heard of this guy, but he, he has a pretty good uh, re reputation. He also is a denier that Biden w was elected president. That is not my cup of tea. But he has denied frequently that this is a, uh, a fake election result. He's going to have to answer for that. But I think we're going to go well past the 17th of November to get a deal. How much, Greg, is former President Trump driving the bus here? We heard from him this morning congratulating yeah. uh, all of the congressmen and saying that Mike Johnson is the strong suggestion from him. Well, it looks like Trump has veto power, doesn't it? Uh, the guy from Minnesota uh, he lasted for like eight hours uh, before Trump. And then Trump boasted that I killed the nomination. So Trump is taking a very overt role in the House. And I've got to think there are a lot of House members who resent it. How much is there still discussion about some sort of bipartisan answer? We heard that for a hot second and then it was dropped because it was politically not viable on either side. I wouldn't put the chances at much more than 20 percent. If that, uh, I think it's unlikely that we could get it. If this thing totally breaks down and we get into the winter without anything, well, then all bets are off. And I think Hakeem Jeffries might have to intervene, but it's not coming yet. And Greg, this drama, this disarray that we're seeing in the House among the Republicans, have we seen the Democrats try to capitalize off of that? Not as much as I would have expected. Uh, I think they're sitting back. What's the old saying? If your uh, opponent is self-destructing, don't get in the way. Uh, so I think the Democrats will stay pretty uh, muted. But at some point, they may have to be called to uh, enter this fight. Greg Villiers, I want to go back to a comment you said, because I really think we need to paint this picture. The New York Times reporting, Mark Santoro, of the war east of Kherson. This is down by the Black Sea, folks. This is east of Odessa, east of Romania. And Ukrainian forces are surprising by moving east along the shores of the Black Sea, again, east of Kherson. What do they need from us that's going to wait for the winter financing by America? Do they literally run out of artillery, run out of ammunition? Well, timing is everything, Tom, and I think that we, they've only got another few weeks before it's the mud season, and we have four months of mud and ice and, you know, basically a, a stalemate. They will get more uh, arms, I think, from Western Europe, but I, I, again, looking at Washington, I think it's going to come later rather than sooner. All wars have always been marked by propaganda efforts. We've always seen that through history. It's something uh, very notable. This time feels different, though, whether it's Ukraine or whether it's Israel. And some of the images that are coming out in social media, some of the battles that are coming out in social media. How do you view this information war as having a materially different nature than previous ones? Well, the first casualty of war, as we all know, is the truth. And I think it's going to continue to be very difficult to uh, to ascertain who's winning, who's losing. Uh, I don't think that's going to change. Greg Villiers. Thank you so much. With AGF Investments, always an important morning uh, note here on uh, our multiple war fronts. And, and, you know, I think this has been underplayed this morning, but I'm going to go back to my triangulation theme, which many in international relations were talking about. Again, I, I can't say enough about Daniel Byman uh, at CFR, but Israel's not just about Gaza. It's about he, he would suggest the West Bank is a huge focus away from the atrocity of Gaza. But then there's also, of course, Hezbollah up by uh, Lebanon. This is a multi-front war. This is a multi-front war already when it comes to information, when it comes to the emotion behind it, when you see the protests emerging in many places, when you see the clashes on social media. At a certain point, how do you move forward? And we were talking about that earlier this morning. How do you move forward with a viable solution if people still have have uh, sort of these these issues that are coming to the fore, unresolved issues from the past. Um, we, yeah, Katie, please. I was going to say, I mean, the fact that it is a multi-front war, that there's so many actors involved. I keep thinking about what Secretary of State Antony Blinken said yesterday, mm. a very direct message to Iran, basically saying, no, Iran, your proxies don't attack America because at that point you have to get involved. Well, there's that, but you know, I'm going to go again to the military. I don't, I don't think the Israeli military is a multi-front war. They just want to be sure they try not to kill so many people. I mean, it's just that abrupt. 
and it, it bounces up against all the other rhetoric that's out there. Israel right now, what I find most interesting are some of the conversations about the pressure that international leaders are placing on Israel. We're going to talk about this. We're also going to talk about some of the earnings that are coming out after the bell. That's all coming up on The Open. Patrick Frizzetti of Hightower, Zach Griffiths of Credit Sites, Amy with Silverman of RBC, and Daniel Salman of New Street Research. Surveillance, good morning. Interesting day. ECB tomorrow. It'll be interesting to see. A Pharaoh-less ECB. I don't know how we're going to survive that. Lagarde heated at the IMF meetings about an ECB that needs a trajectory to 2%. And we'll have to see. Katie Greifeld in for John Farrell. Bram will get ready for a 9 p.m. ordeal. I, you know, I, I look, Katie, at ECB, and it's just not the same story as the Fed. It's just a completely different dynamic. And I find that so fascinating because for so long, years coming out of the pandemic and in the pandemic, you had these big developed market central banks moving in lockstep. But now we're seeing more right. <clears throat> idiosyncrasies in their economies, and you have to see a much different response from these central banks. Each nation, for every nation for themselves, and maybe is what Ian Bremmer would say. And we'll see that tomorrow. We'll give you some good coverage from Frankfurt. On that. Right now, with uh, red and green in the screen, earnings tech season in uh, uh, full force here. Look for Bloomberg Technology for a real analysis of that in the noonish hour. We get rebriefed here. He's been on the show way too much. It's a, it's a folks' pie of our team, but actually, huge value add. Stephen Rusciuto joins us now, chief U.S. economist in Mizuho Securities. Uh, we all get the consumer boom. We all get that we were wrong. We're in the vicinity of 5% Q3 GDP. Okay, great, but I got an I, I got a G, and I got an NX on the back end. Are they gonna help out the booming consumer? That's the real question. Um, I, you know, I think you could look maybe for a little bit from trade. The real key question is the government component, because to be honest with you, we don't have any good a priori data when it comes to government spending. We do have the monthly Treasury statement of receipts and outlays, and we can look at that, but those don't translate well into the GDP accounts. They don't translate as clearly as other components do. So we're looking at most of the other components and saying nothing else is contributing, so you're right. down to maybe a little bit from trade and how much we get from government. Is there a separation in the eye of big business, ginormous business, successful, profitable, Microsoft-like business investment and everybody else flat on their back. Well, th there clearly is. And when you look at the shipments of non-defense, uh, non-aircraft capital goods, which is the key driver of the uh, equipment investment components that you're looking at, uh, they're really showing you that on a real basis, we're doing nothing in terms, on average, in terms of investing in this economy. But in an environment where you still have sort of an excess supply globally of tradable goods, it's not surprising that we're seeing that. And I want to talk a little bit about a story that ran on the terminal yesterday, that if you take a look at the deficit. The U.S. government ran a $2 trillion deficit in the fiscal year through September. And then you think about what's happening in the bond market. You think about a 10-year at 5%. Does that level make more sense when you think about the deficits that we're running? Well, it certainly makes more sense when you think about the deficits we're running, but it also makes more sense when you ask yourself the question, what level of inflation does this Federal Reserve want? You know, they, they seem to give lip service to the 2% numbers, but they seem to also be paying a a lot of attention to the employment aspects. So they've kind of shifted the, the dual mandate. We used to be inflation first, then employment comes along as a result. Now it's almost like, well, we want to get employment first and see what happens with inflation later. And, you know, maybe we'll tolerate three. So the upward movement in the 10-year note is reflecting a new fair value, which I don't think markets have fully discounted yet. So does that tell you that they still see that, that link between the unemployment rate and what's happening in inflation, that to get inflation back to 2%, you do need to get unemployment up. I think most investors see that. Unfortunately, I don't think this Federal Reserve does. And if you were at the New York Economics Club lunch the other day with Jerome Powell, you really got a TV. sense. You really got a sense that these people, or he in particular as well, are looking at the things like the JOLTS data. Mm. Which, to be honest with you, there isn't that much history behind the JOLTS data. Number one, and number two, the history we have is only available for what we call credit recessions, recessions that were driven by a credit crunch. This is not a recession that would be driven by a credit crunch. This is an inflation 
monetary policy. And that's a different story. And therefore, the reaction the function is very different. Did you feed David Weston his questions? They were so vicious and so mean-spirited. I'm like, Rashido's giving him those questions. You know? I thought he could have gone even harder, but he did. Yeah, well, you know, that, that, that'd be like if Farrow was there. Can you imagine John Farrow doing the Economic Club in New York? It would have been good television, I it, have it to would, say. It would be good entertainment. It'd be, you know, it'd be sport. Yeah. But I, you know, Powell, I don't think it was game-changing. I think he's just trying to get from event to event waiting for the data, Katie. I will say that the, the thing that stuck with me from that appearance was the focus on financial conditions. I mean, I think he said financial conditions at least 15 times. When you look at financial conditions, you think about the lag of monetary policy. Have we finally started to see that? Well, see, I don't follow the financial conditions indices that are on the street simply because they're reflecting long-term interest rates, which, to be honest, we should be driven by inflation, not by real rates. That's number one. Number two, I don't look at it because they're looking at currency, and the currency is really not part of the financial conditions in the marketplace. I look at the availability of companies to bring paper to market and get that paper sold. And I look at the Treasury's ability to bring a ridiculous amount of paper to market and get it sold. And all these markets are functioning beautifully. So I sit there and say, you know what, there really isn't illiquidity in the system. Financial conditions aren't tightening in the sense that really matters matters to the economy. It's tightening in the sense that we're trying to measure what would cause a credit crunch, but there is no preconditions for a credit crunch. Right. There's no asset liability mismatch, and there's no valuation problem to right. be triggered. And therefore, these things are looking for the wrong indicator. Halloween. I'm going as gamma this year. It's my <laughs> Greek letter this year. But after Halloween, we've got a Fed meeting, and we have a jobs report. The first jobs report question for October, folks, with uh, Mr. Rusciuto of Mizuho. Is it finally going to slow down? I, I don't think so. No, because you're, you're in an environment still where the initial unemployment claims are telling you that we still have a very, very tight labor market. The continuing claims numbers are telling you we still have a very, very tight labor market. So the people that are getting laid off are getting hired fairly quickly. So I don't think it will show up. And will there be some potential for a little bit of weakness in the payroll employment number and the headline number month over month, a little bit of a change? Sure, but we're not seeing right. any real substantive change in the underlying dynamics of the labor market. Steve, thank you so much, particularly for the frequent visits as well. Really, sure. really valuable. Stephen Rusciuto with us with Mizuho Securities today. Without question, the number one thing Bloomberg Surveillance has dropped the ball on in the last 10 days, the horrific narrative from the Eastern Mediterranean, all the other distractions, including a generational bond debacle, is the labor economy of Detroit and Dearborn. We have to have an update. And we do so this morning with our David Welch. He's a Bloomberg Detroit bureau chief herding cats and trying to figure who gets the Lions tickets this weekend. David, I, I guess it's worse. I saw the Ram pickup factory is going to go out as well. Have you been surprised by the worserness of the strike as we staggered through October? Not really. I mean, we, 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 saw, we knew there was going to be a strike. And with the rhetoric from the union, uh, new union president, Sean Fain, he, he promised to go for quite a bit, bringing pensions back, bringing back cost of living allowance, all of these sort of 90s, 2000 era benefits, yeah. big pay raises. He started off wanting 40 percent, actually compounded it would be 46 percent. You know, when you get the membership in a lather over huge benefits and pay like that, you have to deliver something that's that's really strong. And the companies were, were you know, as you can imagine, really far apart on that. You know, but I, and, uh, you know, I'm going to look at your hyperdrive uh, thing. Craig Trudell writing this, and I'm sorry, Mary Barra is not on the same page. She's trying to figure out technology forward. Explain the disparate, almost time zone between a UAW and their nostalgia and Mary Barra and her EV challenges trying to figure out what 2027 looks like. This is sort of an existential question for the union. The workers just want to keep their jobs and keep making money, and they see electric vehicles as a threat. Uh, and for obvious reasons, right? The battery plants that are coming are all non-union. They're all co jointly owned with Asian companies that don't have unions here. And the unions have to go about organizing them just to get influence in that part of the industry again. And that, that eventually would replace engine and transmission workers. Um, and look, Based on what GM told us on earnings day, it's going to take longer for that to happen. So the union's got some breathing space. But they're still working on that now as part of this strike, is getting some sort of guarantee or at least a framework and an understanding 
about how workers who work in battery plants and other EV, you know, electric vehicle parts facilities, how they'll be paid, compensated, what their benefits will be like, and whether or not they have union membership. And the union wants the companies to help them with that because they don't want to see their influence go away because technology comes about. Well, David, talk to us about the distance that still remains just on the wage level, because I'm looking at Bloomberg's reporting, all three company, companies offering a 23% wage increase. I know the UAW has been pushing for 25%. It seems like maybe we're starting to get closer. We are, and Sean Fain even said that on Friday, and, and so did a guy named Mike Booth, who's a vice president of the union, told me that out at a rally in Detroit on Thursday, that the pieces are there for the economics, and they're pretty close. Uh, GM and Stellantis are, are fairly close to Ford's offer, which is a little bit better than theirs on things like cost of living allowance and pensions, and I, I think they can get there. <clears throat> What's going on here is the union added a strike at, at the Ram pickup plant and the Cadillac Escalade Chevy Suburban Tahoe plant in Arlington, Texas. And, and Sean Fain sort of telegraphed this too Friday. He said the last mile can be the toughest one. He told workers to be prepared to strike. Uh, and, and I think he's trying to, he knows they're close. He knows they're getting about as good a deal as he can get. But hey, he's he's got plenty of money in his strike fund and he's going to walk out at a couple more plants to squeeze out every last penny he can in this contract. And I think that's what's going on now. So I think they are fairly close, but he's also a wild card and he's been known to move the goalposts. So we'll see. But I, I think they are pretty close. But, uh, you know, if you have one thing they don't settle on, that keeps everybody out. Mm, yeah, the fiend wild card. But you think about some of the economic damage that's being inflicted on these companies. GM yesterday, even though they pulled their guidance, of course, they don't know what their profit will look like. They did say that strike costs alone have reached $800 million so far. Is that the case at Ford, at Stellantis as well? They haven't told us, but analyst estimates are pretty similar amounts of money. In fact, Ford's uh, Ford's damage from this was a little higher because they walked out at the Kentucky pickup truck plant uh, before they they hit the uh, the GM and Stellantis truck plants. And those pickup truck plants, look, they they sell pretty pricey vehicles and, and, and a lot of them, and they make a lot of money. But they're, they're all roughly in the same kind of damage. There is sort of a bit of perspective here. When, when the union shut down every General Motors plant for 40 days back in 2019, it cost the company, I think it was $3.2 billion. So this fact that they're doing these walkout strikes, adding a plant here, a plant yeah. there, it does really reduce the economic damage. But uh, even if they get a tentative agreement right. this week, it's probably another couple of weeks to ratify it. So there, there'll be more losses, even if they right. get a settlement very soon. Thanks for the brief, David. We've been remiss on this in the last number of days. David Welch driving the ship in Detroit and Dearborn for uh, Bloomberg. Uh, the VIX under 19, 18.95. Boeing and uh, Microsoft may be distorting things a little bit. Crude oil under $84 a barrel. Standard & Poor's 500 down 14 points, three-tenths of a percent. One of our agreements with Katie Greifeld's people is they said to us, you know, really on the back end of the show here, you got to go crypto, all that. We're going to do that. In the next block, we're going to talk about um, SBF. Sam Bankman-Fried Bankman nailed that. We're going to talk about this is really important. With all the hysteria out there that's been going on, uh, we're going we're to talk about this uh, with someone with massive cred on this and massive uh, uh, authority as well. Right now, though, we got to get a capture, a picture here of BitDog. We do this with Catherine Greifeld. Of course, with all of her work with crypto and true reporting with our team on Binance and the rest. And the moonshot of crypto from pandemic level is up 69,000. That's where I loaded the boat. <laughs> and then down we go. And I guess we've recovered. And I, I guess it's a trend with a friend. Can you say bull or bear market in Bitcoin? Is that actually logical? The term actually, instead of bear market, you say crypto winter. And we've oh, definitely yeah. been living in a crypto winter. You are seeing a lot of enthusiasm come back at least into the price right now. But a lot of that, it seems to be predicated on hopes that we're finally going to see a U.S. spot Bitcoin <clears throat> ETF launch. If it does, I would just point you back to that chart. When we saw the futures ETF launch yeah. about two years ago, it top ticked it. That was a sell the news event. We got up to $69,000. Haven't been there in a long time. We'll see if it's a similar experience this time around. Greifel, just fantastic. Bitcoin charts on radio. That really works. Coming up on Bloomberg Originals, it is ruin. 
It's in the fall of FTX and Sam Bankman Freed, and just critically, this is a gentleman at Bloomberg definitive on the truth and SPF. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. I think he just had the mentality that he has to win. It was almost like trying to explain like business ethics 101 to a baby. Sam has basically become a villain in everyone's minds. This committee will not stop until we uncover the full truth behind the collapse of FTX. So, Mark. Are you in? I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. We're in. Finally, that's all I'm going to say. It's finally, this is the absolute definitive zero BS view of this folly. It is ruin. It is a Bloomberg Originals. It is, I, I guess I'd call it almost mean spirited in its abruptness. It is absolutely extraordinary. And it is extraordinary because of Zeke Fox. Who in God's name is Zeke Fox? Katie, help me here. <laughs> Number Go Up is the definitive book on this. My good friend Michael Lewis has done, you know, it's a more Michael Lewis treatment. And Zeke just went out and did Number Go Up and said, hey, here's the reality. I happen to be friends with Zeke, so I particularly like this book. And uh, he did a lot of reporting to, for it, too. The work that went into this book, Zeke traveled around the world for it. And that really comes through. And I actually read this book on vacation. And I try not to read too much on vacation. I'm trying to read the, you know, the, the you drive down the road and you <laughs> read it on it. Joining us now with a victory lap on ruin, Zeke Fox joins us in Washington this morning. Zeke, congratulations. You tear apart the celebrity ness of this. I love it. You've got in that thing we just saw, folks, all the people smiling, going, do it, do it, or whatever they were or saying there. When did you realize? that Sam Bankman Freed was in trouble and there were some serious issues? So I spent a lot of time with him when things were going great. And he was amazing at seeming like he had nothing to hide. I went down to the Bahamas right after the Super Bowl when he aired those, you know, don't miss out, buy crypto ads. And he was just like, yeah, pull up a chair. Watch me do my thing. He's emailing with billionaires. He's doing interviews with other reporters, all the while playing video yeah. games. Um, and so I wish I could say that I suspected something was up, but I didn't realize. I thought it was obvious that he was running a crypto casino where people are going to come buy random coins and maybe lose money gambling on them. But I never suspected right. that he was stealing all the money out the back of the casino. Yeah, Katie, jump in here with your good friend Zeke Fox. But I'm just going to suggest... Pharaoh, Abramowitz, Greifeld, Keen. Are we going to the Bahamas? I don't think so. This guy's got the dream. Get you know, I was actually supposed to go sorry. to that conference, and I got COVID, and I couldn't go, and I really wish I had. But, Zeke, talk to us about the evolution of your reporting, because as you lay out and you own it, you know, you didn't catch it, but then you did. So what, what was that process like? So... I was very suspicious of crypto, a skeptical that there was really anything there. And the funny thing about Sam Bankman Freed is he had this great, this, when he met somebody who was crypto skeptic, he presented as someone who was skeptical too. And he would say, hey, you know, yeah, there's a lot of scams out there, but I'm running this great exchange. I'm just going to collect a little fee on each trade. And as long as crypto exists in some, in some regard, I'm going to make money. In a weird way, even though he looked like a kid who'd been up all night playing video games, he presented himself as kind of the adult in the crypto, in the crypto room. It's a great point, too, that the cynicism that he seemed to express definitely gave an air of legitimacy. But talk to us about how the wheels finally started to come off. About almost a year ago at this point is when we saw that implosion. But that followed months and months of scandals. I mean, you think about what happened with Luna, for example. What was the domino effect that led to FTX finally imploding? Yeah, so in the summer of 2022, this like crypto house of cards collapsed and Luna, which was like almost openly a Ponzi scheme that had $60 billion collapsed. And there were all these crypto lending companies that had lent billions of dollars to hedge fund, crypto hedge funds to invest in different coins. This like all that credit co contracted 
And I, I always suspected, like, I was like, hey, right. how are you guys earning these interest for these high interest rates? How are you earning money in crypto? Are you just, like, going and buying a lot of YOLOing into Dogecoin or something like that? And everybody was uh, always like, Doge. oh, no, no, no. <laughs> oh, no. And then, like, the truth came out. Pretty much that's what they were all doing. Yeah. Zeke, I had an offspring lose money in Doge. It's your fault. Okay, look, Zeke, let's cut to the chase here. You did history at Cornell, which is a great parchment, and you understand the perspective here. I want you to look forward with Bitcoin. You've got Ruin coming out on Bloomberg Originals. SBF is distracted, to say the least. BlackRock and other entities want to do an ETF. It's not the Doge, but it's Bitcoin. What's your response to the forward view of securitizing Bitcoin for the public? I think that in the end, any company, any coin, its value has to come from it having use in the real world. And at this point, Bitcoin is as old as Uber. It's as old as WhatsApp. And ask yourself, have you ever used Bitcoin for anything? Do you right. know anybody who's ever used Bitcoin for anything? Um, so I just I'm not optimistic that people are going to adopt it as some sort of right. replacement for gold when there's no real use of Bitcoin right. for transactions. In piecing ruins together for Bloomberg Original, ruin together for Bloomberg Originals, what was the biggest surprise in this narrative in this story? I mean, I think that the story is even the more you look into the FTX story, just like the worse it looks. Like, at first, SPF was trying to say, hey, it was just like a big mistake, right? And then we're, I was pretty sure, hey, no, you made the decision to borrow your customer funds. That's fraud. And then the more we've looked into it, the more it started to seem like the fraud may have started even earlier than we thought. And at the trial, more and more has come out about how they defrauded lenders to Alameda, the affiliated hedge fund mm. or how they misled venture capitalists who invested in FTX. And Zeke, we don't have a lot of time left, but Ruin's coming out. It's a great look at the past. Going forward with the trial, what do we have to expect here? The prosecution has almost wrapped up their case. They may finish it tomorrow. And oh. we don't know whether the defense is going to present a case at all. What I'm really curious about is whether Sam will take the stand. I mean, he loves to talk. He took every call from every reporter on the way up. And I just think it's hard to imagine he'll resist the chance to right. argue his case in front of this jury, especially because right. his lawyers don't seem to have been very convincing so far. Zeke. Congratulations on your book. It has made, folks, I can't say enough about the accolade Zeke Fox is. You know, the movie rights, it's amazing what he's doing. I mean, I, I, think, get those. I think, you know, DiCaprio plays Zeke. You know, I think that's what I'd, <laughs> I'd look for. Zeke Fox with reporter. us here. And seriously, folks, this is extraordinary. It is hard hitting. It has ruined the fall of crypto exchange FTX and Sam Bankman Freed. This is not some light gloss over. It's there. It's digital. It's out on YouTube and, of course, on Bloomberg uh, as well. Look for that and then tonight, premiere 6 p.m. And, of course, through all the digital response as well. I didn't realize the court case is upon us. Yeah, yeah. I, I, help me with that. It's like now? Yeah, it kicked off uh, a few weeks ago. It was expected to last about six weeks. And it's been pretty amazing to watch. I mean, you've seen What's a lot of— What's your observation? <sighs> I'm just, I want to hear from Sam Bankman Freed. We'll see if he takes the stand. We've heard from uh, everyone else, it feels like, who was involved. Yeah. The only, the only uh, critique I would have is that cameras aren't allowed inside the courtroom, which would be very interesting to see. We've had to rely on these drawings of what's actually happening oh, this inside This is called the old room. journalism. This is before <laughs> your time where actually there was a guy with a quill and he dipped it in the inkwell and mm -hmm. they did drawings as well. So it's there. Well, as a result, we actually <clears throat> haven't seen Sam Bakeman freed of course he has been in custody so we've had photos of other witnesses yeah. walking in we haven't seen Sam no. Bakeman freed apparently he's gotten a haircut I would like to see it oh we'll have to see that I get a haircut it doesn't make news <laughs> crypto Catherine Greifeld and other worthies here at Bloomberg really giving you an update here and of course this ginormous news driving uh, BitDog up to 34,000 it's a bull market and uh, Bitcoin it's really been abrupt move I mean are you 
surprised? It's been parabolic. And I think when parabolic. you look at the, oh. the chart, the one-year chart, you look at the line straight up, it really shows you that this is a pretty illiquid market. The trading volume has just oh, not been there. she's busting my chops. <laughs> she wants to get me in trouble here. She's going to ruin me. That's a joke. Ruin. Get it? Yeah. Bloomberg Originals. Documentary. Ruin. See how I did that? Yeah. It's, it's, it's a nice Segui. Ruin tonight. Bloomberg Originals. Coming up on Bloomberg TV, Christiana Aman Qualcomm, President and Chief Executive Officer. With futures, not red and green in the screen. Let me give you the 10-year, oh, wow, 2.47% on the real yield. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg Surveillance.